Okay. Uh, okay, so basically, Callum has had, he's had internet problems, so the session didn't open, so apologies to everybody, not the start we needed. How is everyone? <laughs> Great. Yeah, Bye. Okay. <laughs> oh dear, so we're not going to be able to see or hear Callum because I believe he's on his phone. So, has everyone been able to get in? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows, yes. Does it not tell us how many participants are in anywhere? It says 102 at the moment. That sounds promising. Oh, yeah. yeah, that includes us, so it's 92. Right. And I think we've, I think the broadcast has already started and we've left the um, preparation room. Can you hear me, Zoe? I can. So, yeah, I'm, I'm still not going to be able to do anything physically. My internet is still actually down. I'm on my hotspot, but it's really, really bad. So you're at home, are you? I'm at home, yeah. My internet, unfortunately, is down. So everything's cabled in and stuff, and there's just no no connection. I've, I've, I've managed to just get a really bad Wi-Fi receiver on my computer so I can okay. hotspot to my phone. Which luckily I had. Unfortunately, I didn't have a, a proper laptop. It's not worked. Um, it's just really, really bad timing, unfortunately. Um, yeah, the broadcast has been sent live, though, by the way, by one of the organisers. Um, okay. Well, <laughs> I think that's that was destiny. We were going to do that, weren't we? Okay. So is it? Yeah. Oh, look, it's after half past. So we need to make a start. Um, yeah. So um, I can see that. I can see that everyone. Uh, all of the staff um, have all got webcams and mics registering, so it should just be a matter of turning them on, which is good. Okay. So if you want to get some of the um, presenters uh, to turn their mics on, uh, so or unmute the mics and turn the webcams on, then we should be able to start sort of seeing and hearing people. Okay. Who's who's the first presenter, uh, Zoe? Because you'll be able to make you should be able to make someone else. That's, the... that's me. <laughs> oh, perfect. That's... Okay. Sharing. Show screen. Show my screen. Okay. So. Hopefully the audience is with us. Um, you can probably tell by now that we've had some technical difficulties. So I hope you're seeing and hearing this. Um, and if you are, good morning. Welcome to the Dimpress Day. Um, and I think we should probably make a start. So I'm going to hand over to Erica, who is going to introduce our first speaker this morning. Um, so, Erica, are you there? And Hi, I everyone. Can you hear me? My screen. I can hear you, Erica. Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to our first Zoom or webinar uh, Simtress Forum Day. Um, very excited about this. Uh, please excuse the background. My partner's just making me a cup of tea because everyone needs that. I'm very, very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Lindell. Uh, Lindell is uh, directly connected with us because she's working at the Natural History Museum and hopefully is going to fascinate you with one of the new big projects that she's very, very much involved with when it comes to Ditra in the UK. So Lindell, please wow the audience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Um, I don't have a button for sharing my screen, I'm afraid. <laughs> Right. Okay. Presenter. Da, da, da. Where are you, Lindo? Oh. oh, you're not on my list, Lindo. Uh, I I've got the button now. Can you see my screen? You've got the button now. Oh, excellent. Good. Yes. Okay. So everyone can see this. I hope so. <laughs> can, can you see it? I can. 
Okay, good. Um, all right. Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here. And I'm going to talk to you about how to squash as many flies into the Darwin Tree of Life project <laughs> as we can. So um, just to give you a, a quick background on the project. So the main aim is to sequence high quality reference genomes for all over 60,000 UK species. It's currently a network of 10 partner institutions, um, as you can see on the right. And the goal is to generate data that is relevant and of immediate use. So this kind of project has never been done before in the world. And so the reason British biota has been chosen in this pilot is because it's one of the best known in the world. They have really amazing detailed location records, a thriving community of engaged naturalists, and the biota represents over a third of family diversity on Earth. So um, just to recap on the terms that I'm going to be using, um, genome versus DNA barcode, if we look at all these squiggly colorful lines, these are chromosomes and they all represent a genome. And if we look at just one of those chromosomes, um, within that chromosome we have genes and um, normally a DNA barcode is a small section of one of these genes. So for a genome, as an example for this Drosophila, it holds about 130 million bases of information, while if we look at a DNA barcode, it's about 600 bases. So it just shows you how much more information you can get out of the genome. And then um, to sort of show you the benefits of genomes and barcodes, um, with a genome, you generally do about one genome per species because it's quite a, a long, costly process but it can give you improved predictions of the effects of climate change on biodiversity. You can use it with invasive species and get really detailed history um, and invasion routes for species, as well as looking into um, the adapt adaptiveness of a species. Um, does it have the potential to be invasive if it's introduced somewhere? And then one of my absolute favorites is the conservation genomics. And with all this information for all these species, we can really understand the dynamics of genes that um, you know, can help us avoid extinction. And then also um, high resolution species detection, tracking and monitoring in the environment. And that includes um, abundance as well, which is really important for monitoring. And then if we look at DNA barcodes, you can have multiple barcodes per species. Um, it's quick and easy to do, but it's also a very important first step in the genome pr um, sequencing process because we use a barcode to sort of track um, that sequencing process through. The NHM is also currently building a DNA barcode reference library with um, verifiable morphological vouchers that will be um, curated into the collection. You can also map uh, species distributions and populations with barcodes over wide geographic areas, which is very useful. Uh, and barcodes can be and are currently being used um, for tracking and monitoring and detecting species in the environment, but it's a lot less sensitive than um, using genomics. Okay, so back to the detail side um, and our goals by numbers, our priority number one is maximum phylogenetic coverage. So in the phase one, which is where we are now, uh, we're looking at families, and so that's representative of each family. And that would be 2,000 to 4,000 taxa um, that we would get genomes for. Phase two, we start looking at the genera, which is about 20,000 taxa. And then phase three, absolutely everything, about 60,000. And then other priorities that um, we include in, well, in all the phases, but in this phase as well, is research interest, if something is iconic, important, um, in, whichever way, protected, endemic, and also, especially in the first phase, targetable. Um, is it actually feasible to find and catch, or is it thought to be extinct or very hard to find? And if we have a look at the diptera, um, specifically, the scope for phase one 
is um, 150 species fully genome sequenced by um, 2022. But then we also need 850 um, waiting in the wings for phase two. So if we have a look at the global total of diptera, there are about 188 families and um, 150,000 described species. We all know there's a lot more than that. Um, and then in the, in the British Isles, we have 111 families, which is a whopping 60% of the global total, which is amazing. And um, yeah, so that's the first phase is only 150. Um, and then after 2022, it's going to go full steam ahead to do the other about 6,800 species in the UK. So if we have a look at, oh, no, if we have a look at the total in process um, as of this month, we have 45 families in the bank, 154 genera, and 239 species. And um, we're also trying, well, we DNA barcoding every species that comes in, but we're also trying to get an extra species for a morphological voucher. So our barcoding total um, is 56 families, 200 genera, and 342 species. And so of our genome um, sequencing species, we have from White and Woods, let's just go to the next slide. From White and Woods, um, of those 239, we have 177 species collected from 33 families, including 55 species of hoverfly, which is quite amazing. Um, if we have a look at the sample processing that we do, this is um, sort of a brief cap of what we look at, of what we do. So we, well, we have the specimen collected, we snap freeze it from live, um, it needs to be identified live at this stage, we dissect it cold, and so often with arthropods anyway, it's into head, thorax, and abdomen. We try and keep a morphological voucher as well. So if there's some diagnostic part, we, we take that. We DNA barcode um, the legs, and we need a very stringent tracking process because one specimen can technically be in three places at one time. Um, and one of the really important parts of this is having these verifiable vouchers. So most of the time, um, because of this process and needing the whole specimen, we um, don't have a, an actual physical voucher. So sometimes this permanent, uh, permanently stored, curated um, voucher is in the form of DNA. It can be tissue, it can be really good photographs, or in best case scenario, an actual diagnostic part of the organism. And then it's submitted for sequencing. So some of the big challenges that are going to be for, come up for diptera are small species, smaller than about five millimeters, and species that can only be identified under a microscope as a not alive. Um, and so the solutions, we have a research and development group that are working on this, um, and another option which we can potentially use in the interim is actually um, using the high quality DNA barcode reference library to actually match the specimen too. So you wouldn't identify it, you'd just snap freeze it unidentified and then match it to the DNA barcode library later. So um, as we go on with the project, it's going to, we're going to need some lists so people can see, the public can see what we've collected, um, how many specimens we've collected, and this needs to be readily, readily available, especially um, in sort of the short collecting or fieldwork season. So we're working on these um, detail live lists. So the actual live list for detail is not quite ready yet, but here is a really good example from Ben Price at the museum called Fresh Base, which does include some uh, freshwater diptera. And so it's a, um, a Google spreadsheet that is linked to the data portal, the NHM data portal. And every time something goes into the NHM, it automatically updates this well, every Monday. And the nice thing is that each one of these species names, you can click on it and it takes you to the portal. You can see where it was collected, who collected, and all the other information that's captured. So it'd be really great to have something like this for the whole of Diptera and the whole detailed project so that everyone knows exactly what's happening all the time. So 
And then speaking of timelines, which is a work in progress, um, we hope that things won't take as long as what I'm showing you here, but this is um, sort of what we're anticipating in the beginning while we work on, on making things quicker. So we want every specimen that is collected to be trackable, at least within the two months, but as soon, essentially, as soon as it comes into the museum and goes into our collection management system, it should pop up on those live lists. And then if your specimen is chosen to go to whole genome um, sequencing and is successful, this um, process can take up to a year um, and you will be, so that's a year for it to be sequenced. Um, once it's assembled and annotated, then you will be an author on the published genome note. That can take over a year, depending. And then, of course, if your species was really small, um, it's probably going to be moved to phase two, but that depends on the research and development that's done. If you collect a specimen and it goes for DNA barcoding, the morphological voucher will be curated into the NHM collections um, and associated with the project and the DNA, but that could also take um, up to a year, depending on how close to winter it is, because that's sort of when my team will have enough time to curate the specimens. Um, but then the DNA extract from that specimen will go into our molecular collections facility, also trackable um, on the portal or on our live list. And that should be two to four months after we receive it. And then um, your barcode will also be uploaded to a publicly accessible database. Um, and that can also take up to a year. So that sort of gives you an idea of how long at things at the moment, how long things are, are taking, but hopefully that time will be a lot shorter in the future. So um, detail 2021 for sampling. Um, where possible, as I, I did mention before, we're trying to collect more than one specimen of each species, some for genome sequencing. Also, if it's very small, we may need a bit more tissue, but um, at least one for genome sequencing and at least one for DNA barcoding so we can have this morphological voucher. We plan to run BioBlitz events across the United Kingdom, um, and the NHM are also receiving live, live specimens via post, so do contact us for tubes. Um, or other information. And we also want to do um, some smaller targeted field trips as we go, but it just depends on, on what we've collected and we'll have to play that by ear. We've also put together an expertise survey. So please do um, fill it in if you can. It's in green at the bottom, tinyurl.com forward slash invert experts. And we would, so we would like to know um, your area of expertise, your taxonomic groups, and we'd like to keep you updated on field work and potentially our live species lists. And you can also suggest your favorite fly for sequencing. And then another invitation to the amazing White and Woods by Liam. It is an amazing place with a great research station. It looks like it's been refurbished quite recently as well. So. It's uh, one of the sites um, of the longest ecological studies in the world and really potential, a good spot for a potential field meeting in 2021. And if anyone wants to do any ad hoc collections, please contact Liam on the email. And then um, just to tempt you further, he's included some really nice pictures of some really nice flies. And with that, I would like to thank everybody who's involved directly with the DETAIL project. Um, a long list of people are working together to make this happen, which is quite amazing. And then, of course, a special thanks to those who've sent specimens in, um, especially during the pandemic and lockdown and, and then our little field trip to Hearts Lock. So thank you so much, Mike, Ryan, Chris, Matt, Sam, Mark, and Duncan. And then there is the um, the link to the survey um, in green as well to remind you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks Excellent. very much. Thanks for that. That was lovely. Um, we have um, some questions that have come in now, which is great. Um, I'm just too busy thinking about how what my favourite fly is, so you're completely <laughs> distracting me. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, from Sue Taylor, we've been asked, how do you screen out pathogen 
uh, pathogenic fungi and bacteria? Uh, I think that would be a really good question for Mara, who's speaking next. Sorry, I yeah. don't think I can help you with that. Uh, this may also be a Mara one then as well. Does it work for killed pin specimen as well for live specimens? Ah, uh, well, for DNA barcoding, killed specimens uh, and dry specimens is possible, but it isn't for gene. You wouldn't be able to get the genome out of a dry specimen. It has to be live and snap frozen as quickly as possible. So, so you're getting lots of people to send specimens in the post. Uh, yes, yeah, sending them live, sort of not that successful all the time. Depends on no. the weather, I think. <laughs> yes, quite adverse at the moment. Do we mm. have any more? Uh, do you welcome, oh, do you take photos of specimens before assembling? And that's from Alexander Butler. Um, well, we take photos of the specimens before we dissect them, if that's what you mean. So we do take a high, yeah, a sort of high resolution, try and do a couple of views. Um, and hopefully you catch the diagnostic part, but we're still working on the SOPs to figure out exactly which part of every species is diagnostic before we yeah. photograph it. So quite That's going to be quite complicated, I presume. It, it is, it is, yeah. yeah. We'll have the long version of the SOP and then the short version. Yes, ones. yeah. Um, how about international cooperation? Are there similar barcoding projects in Germany, Norway, et cetera? And that's from Paul Burke. The, for barcoding, yes, and that is something Mara will also mention in her talk um, with international collaboration. But I think for the genome work now, this is the this is the pilot. So hopefully we figure out all the kinks, and then it will be easier for everyone else to to pick up and fly with it. Oh. Okay, there's a lovely one here from I'm a student from, and they don't say, then you need Hashani, Hashani, but they would like to join in with your research work. <laughs> so how does everyone help? I presume in the UK, it's going out and finding you fresh flies and identifying them. Yes, yes. So we definitely rely very heavily on the community of experts. Um, and that's going to be the success of this project is having everybody working together. Um, anyone who wants to get involved and you're in the UK, you can email, um, yeah, maybe I should put an email there, but anyone from Darwin Tree of Life, there's contact at darwintreeoflife.org. I think, is that right, Moira? Yes. Um, or any of us at NHM, Zoe as well. I mean, she can also, um, anyone really, contact anyone. We'll find, we'll find um, the information that you need. Yeah. And I love this one from Donald Smith. <laughs> Why so many other flies? I think it's a question we all ask. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think there's just a there. lot of them. There's just, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, let me go through. If we collect specimens other than the flies, are you interested in those at present? And that's from Ab Bill Irwin. Absolutely. We, if it's identified, <laughs> we are definitely very interested. We're doing everything. The survey um, link is also to all invertebrates of the UK. So that's marine, terrestrial, freshwater. So it's not just flies. <laughs> but obviously the flies are the most important. Of course. Of there course. we go, that's what we want And to I don't do. say that at every meeting. <laughs> of course you don't. Nicely <laughs> answered there. <laughs> Do we have any more questions from the panel or anyone else would like to make any input? Erica, have you seen this last one? Does the post office question buzzing parcels? <laughs> no, I guess it's just come in. Brilliant. Well, actually, it is. It, we have checked it is legal to send um, live and six in the post. So they don't question it. They're technically okay yeah, with it. I think you have to write it on the outside and then it's fine. I think most people who've got cockroaches and things like that have sent many a live insect in the post. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, oh, there are a few more. Oh, it's gone. Um, I will quickly just ask you, what's been the biggest challenge so far in gathering DNA-ready specimens? And that's Stephanie Skip. Ah, I know you, Steph Skip. Um, 
<laughs> sure. Biggest challenge of actually collecting. Um, wow. I actually think it was getting permission to put dry ice into the van so that we could take it into the field and process <laughs> specimen. That was probably the hardest part. Wow. Um, uh, no, but it, yeah, it's, it's yeah, all quite a challenge at the moment. Haven't taken dry ice and planes. That was equally entertaining. Oh. I, I agree. I understand wow. your whatever. <laughs> Right, let's move on to the next talk then. And um, I'm very pleased to introduce someone I've been working with quite a long time now, Mara. And Mara is going to be talking to us again about this, but she's gonna be talking more specifically about the molecular techniques involved in this Darwin Tree of Life project. Welcome, Mara. Thank you, Erica. Um, I'm still waiting for the button that lets me share my screen. I love this magic button. I know, it's excellent. Isn't it? I've made you, I've changed the presenter and I've selected you, Mara. Is that, has that made any difference? Um, it still seems to look like it's Linda. Ah. Uh, Don't suppose um, I'm supposed to see something. Can you see anything on the sharing at the top? Linda. I can see that I can share my screen. Okay. Um, Do you have a change presenter option? No, I do not. No, you not you. Oh, oh no, I'm sharing again, sorry. Yeah. I've selected Linda, but it's apparently not making any difference. Can you unselect yourself, Linda? No, I just end up sharing my screen when I do that. Oh, folks, while we're waiting, um, <laughs> as I, I was just talking to myself, I'd like to use this opportunity to highlight uh, uh, an upcoming webinar um, that's again advertised on the Zipchus Forum website, and it's um, on soldier flies. We had a very, there was a very successful uh, webinar yesterday with the Tenoptera project, and that featured flesh flies, which again we'll be discussing uh, further in this project. And now I can stop rambling because Mara is up and ready. Enjoy. Hey. <laughs> okay. Um, somehow, when I try to get rid of this panel, let's see here. Uh, okay, does that work? Yes. Sorry, get rid of this panel. Okay, so um, thank you very much. I'm really, really excited to be here. And um, the eagle-eyed among you may have realized that this green thing on the screen is not a fly, but um, the even more eagle-eyed among you will have realized that there are some fly eggs on this caterpillar. And um, some of you from the audience, I'm sure, assisted me about a year ago on a Facebook Diptrus group and via Twitter to suggest that I should let this caterpillar drill down into the dirt and um, and hatched out some of these flies. And actually, I think, you know, I've been working on flies for 20 years and probably have reared millions of Drosophila and Anopheles mosquitoes. And um, this is the first time I really felt truly, I think, maternal towards a fly. About 11 of these tachinids hatched out seven months later in a little jar that I kept uh, outside. Um, and that it was really exciting. And these exact flies are going to go in for this Darwin Tree of Life project. So I sent a couple over to Chris Raper, who told me what species they were, and a few into the Darwin Tree of Life project, and the rest were released. So I'm working, along with many other people on the project, to try to figure out how we can get around that um, requirement for dry ice that Lyndall just mentioned. So what's somebody asked about the um, pin specimens and whether you can get enough DNA out of pin specimens. And the fact is we can actually get plenty of DNA out of pin specimens and we can sequence their genomes, but the DNA that comes out is extremely fragmented. So it's very hard to put all the pieces back together. It's like if you imagine a jigsaw puzzle and instead of it being in kind of 10 giant pieces, really easy to put together, it's in millions of pieces and, and they all look the same. And it's really hard to get it all back. So I um, have connected with Andrew Lucas, who's a hoverfly expert, and he was collecting, he collected all these species this summer. And I emailed him yesterday to say, you know, basically, can you send me a picture of where the hoverflies are right now? And you can see that they're sitting in his home freezer still next to some peas and ice cream. And um, what we are trying to do is 
collect these into different preservatives without access to dry ice and then just normal home freezer to assess whether we can still get these very big pieces of DNA out at the end. Um, the reason these are still sitting in his freezer though is because we are now ch challenged with making sure that we have all of the records of whether he really has permission to collect in the places he's collected. So as part of this project, if you get involved, that is an important thing to keep in mind is, is for some of these collections, we need to be really, really rigorous about ensuring we have documentation that we were able, that we were permitted to collect where these were collected. So I'm going to take you through the journey of a single fly through this system. And this is a, a ferruginous bee grabber that Liam Crowley collected at Wydham Woods this summer. And this is the actual fly. He collected it, uh, identified it, and popped it in this exact tube, took a picture of it. And you can see this kind of steamy effect. And that's because they're sitting on, they're sitting on dry ice to keep them extremely, to keep that DNA in extremely good, um, in good uh, condition. So we received that tube. We receive hundreds of tubes at Sanger, which is where I work, and it's it's well known for the Human Genome Project, but it's actually now really invested in this um, biodiversity sequencing. And uh, we extract the DNA using um, using basically lab uh, kits, and then we evaluate the quality of the DNA uh, using this machine here called the Femto Pulse. And if you can see my mouse, this. This is the computer connected to this machine. You put in a plate of DNA into this machine. It takes extremely small amounts of DNA and runs it on a capillary on a gel and then re reports back what size pieces of DNA do you have in this extraction. And we need these very long pieces. And then somewhat counterintuitively, we actually take the pieces and then we shear them to sort of a similar size, quite big piece still. So we're looking to make them about 20,000 ACs, Ts, and Gs long. Um, for the for the most important technology we're using at the moment to sequence. And so the DNA then goes into these syringes and you would be um, surprised at how much uh, these simple machines cost. <laughs> this basically machine just moves a syringe up and down at a constant rate and shears the DNA into a very precise uh, size that we are that we need to then sequence it. So once it's sized, we make a library out of it, and then we load that library onto what's called the SQL2 machine, which looks like this. And then this, this little kind of drawer opens up, and inside of it is, a, is effectively a very high-powered robot that is able to um, look at the molecules uh, and understand along those molecules by reading them again and again in a circular sort of framework, um, what are those ACs, Ts, and Gs, and, and in what order are they, and reports back that information onto a computer. This is what the actual, what's called the smart cell looks like. So it's actually, you know, just postage stamp size and a little bit of clear colorless liquid is loaded onto that. And then that machine sequences it. So it's all extremely um, complicated machinery that's working behind the scenes to generate the genomes of these species. So um, we think of DNA as this kind of linear, you know, chromosomes, ACs, Ts, and Gs, but inside of a nucleus, this is what it would really look like. It's all bundled up, kind of a hairball. And each of these different colors is a different chromosome. And the DNA is inside the nucleus interacting in different ways with different parts of the, of the genome. And, and those interactions are really important. Um, there's, there's, there's often reasons why part particular bits of DNA, like the yellow bit here is interacting with the green bit here. So, the whole, the whole system that I just talked you through is we get the sample, we extract the DNA, we share the DNA, we sequence it on PacBio, and then we add in these few other data types, which, I, which I'm not going to spend much time talking about today, but one of those that is called the high c sequencing. And instead of sequencing long molecules, it's actually trying to identify all these connections of how, how is the chromosome organized inside of the nucleus so that you can find pieces of the genome that are nearer to each other and farther from each other. We also generate um, RNA sequencing data, which is the genes that are actually expressed in the organism. And then we put it all together, which we call assembly. So a reference genome, the high quality reference genomes we're trying to assemble, that just means put all the pieces together, um, are really important for the kind of biology we want to do. So I've added a tiny URL here for Bee Grabber, which allows you to go and see that exact specimen I just talked about, the data that we've generated so far for it. And this is this is kind of a quality control website where you can see the species that are in progress right now, but also um, the results for particular species. So this genome of this fly 
went into the sequencer and just with this one technology, the PacBio, so we haven't added in this other information yet, you can see it's come out as over here, it's about 300 million bases long is the estimate of how big the genome is. And most of the genome has come out in pieces that are 9 million bases long or larger. And there's only 104 pieces that this genome has come out in. And this is really a, re a major leap forward for the project in this past year. This technology has really, has really changed how we're able to sequence genomes. So, so far, I looked at that TollQC website where you can go and see the tiny URL bgrabber. And we have already started generating data for 59 species. Um, one of the questions I know for Lindell was around the hoverflies. And, and there are a lot of hoverflies in our project already because we are not only trying to do very big phylogenetic spans, but also take deep dives into some taxonomic groups. And so surfids are one of the groups that we're doing a lot of sequencing in to try to get more species from, multi, from you know, multiple representatives from single families. So just you know, a year into our project, we're out, we've already started generating data for about 1% of the fly species found in the UK, which is exciting. Um, so what can you do with these reference genomes? Um, I work on primarily on Anopheles mosquitoes. And um, I'm not going to get into the details of these projects, but I'll give you a couple of highlights of the sorts of things that we can do. Genomes for maybe 20 different species in the genus. We've been able to look at the places in the genome which are common across all species and identify a more sophisticated way to do barcoding than the single, single molecular target of the mitochondrion, which is typically what DNA barcoding goes for. Anopheles is one of those groups of organisms where DNA barcoding doesn't work very well because there's a lot of interbreeding. So the mitochondrion can move between different species, and it's not a good marker for species level res resolution. You really need to look at pieces of the genome to see what species it is. So we've created tools, because we have so many reference genomes, we can find these loci, these pieces of the genome, where we can actually understand if we go sequence these 60 parts of the genome, just small bits, so much more high throughput than the reference genome stuff I'm talking about, we can then identify what species uh, a, a, a sample is. And we're going to be doing this at very large scale for African Anopheles mosquitoes over the coming years. And as Erica mentioned, we've been working together with the Natural History Museum for a while to also try to understand what did mosquitoes, what did their genomes look like before insecticides were in widespread usage. And in order to do that, again, you really need a reference genome. We can get tiny pieces of DNA, very degraded, 30 or 50 bases long, so 30 or 50 of those A's, C's, T's, or G's from these historic samples that Erica curates that are in the Natural History Museum, sometimes collected over 100 years ago. But we, if we don't have the right reference genome, we can't put those, we can't anchor those little pieces into a genomic context and understand anything about them. So reference genomes are really important also for looking back in time. And then another example is, um, is that we've sequenced the whole genome, so not using this kind of more sophisticated, really high quality DNA, but actually just taking short pieces and being able to align it to that reference genome and put all the pieces back together that way. We've looked at how insecticide resistance mutations move through populations. And the colors here, the red and blue, are kind of generally giving you a different, two different species of Anopheles mosquitoes. And this is looking at a particular, really important insecticide resistance gene. So this mutation has arisen and it confers insecticide resistance to DDTs and to DDT and pyrethroids. And the interspersed red and blue that you can see over here on the right indicates that a resistance mutation has arisen in one species and then spread through interbreeding. I, I said Anopheles mosquitoes kind of don't obey species boundaries very well. So this allele has spread, this mutation has spread from one species into another repeatedly. That's what this back and forth red and blue means. So that brings me to the end of the, of the sort of what do reference genomes do for us and um, why we're so excited about the Darwin Tree of Life project. And I also wanted to take the opportunity because this community um, of kind of fly fans is such an important community to talk to about another big project that we're going to be carrying out over the next five years. So Bioscan, the, the Darwin Tree of Life project is, um, is a project that fits into this global endeavor, which is a kind of vision called the Earth Biogenome Project. So the Darwin Tree of Life Project is, is really kind of the most far, far along and the most advanced in terms of all the different projects that are starting to pop up around the world to generate reference genomes for all million and a half described eukaryotic species that are out there. Bioscan is another big global vision, which is 
instead of trying to get the whole genomes, it's actually starting, it's really trying to, to change the way we do barcoding to not only target the species of interest, but also everything it's interacted with. And so if you imagine that you put a fly into a, into a little tube and you run a barcoding approach on it, but you not only target the barcode that would let you know what the fly is, but also any plants that might be present or any fungi that might be present or any other parasitoids that might be present, you can actually get a marker for each of these different things and understand what is that fly infected with? What is that fly pollinating? What is that fly um, eating? And um, that is the premise of Bioscan. So we will be kicking off Bioscan in the UK um, using malaise traps in the coming, in the coming year. So to, prep, to sort of pilot this, I've set up a malaise trap in my garden for the past year. And you can see that this is the kind of what we're looking to do. We're looking to collect um, for about 24 hours in a, in a trap and then plate out all the specimens that come in, in that are killed into the ethanol in the trap. And then we basically you know, can do high quality imaging. This is not the high quality image that we would do, but gives you a sense of what these flies look like or these other species look like inside of wells of the plate. And then we basically, um, are trying out right now different things, different liquids to put into these wells to make sure that we're getting, we're preserving the specimens so that you can actually go back and morphologically study it, but we're also releasing its DNA, not in such a way, not only in such a way that we can barcode it, but also so that we can preserve it and use it for the Darwin Tree of Life project in coming years, when we know we will be needing to be tackling these much smaller organisms, which right now are not a major part of our project because it's hard to get enough of that high molecular weight DNA out. But we know that technology changes rapidly, and probably in a year or two, we won't need nearly as much DNA as we currently do need right now. So we release the DNA, and then we look at it. And we've actually, this is that femtopulse that I mentioned at the beginning. This is how we kind of, this is the output of that machine, and it tells you the fragment sizes of the DNA that's been released. So quite excitingly, we've been able to collect specimens They've been sitting in ethanol in room temperature <clears throat> or outdoor temperature for 24 hours. And then we do this non-destructive extraction and we look at the DNA that comes out and we're getting the kind of length of molecules that we need for the Darwin Tree of Life project. So the plan is to set this up for the next five years across the country at hundred partner sites. And we'll be aiming to collect 10,000 flying insect specimens each month for the next five years. And so those will all be mailed to us at Steiner. We'll do the DNA barcoding and we will um, image the insects. So these partners that get on board with this project will receive a malaise trap and, and the consumables that are needed. And at the sentinel sites, which um, would be trapping, I think, uh, a little bit more extensively, there's going to be about 10 of those across the country, uh, they will also receive a dissection microscope to help identify and really get um, greater numbers of plating uh, samples out. So it's going to be a partnership in which the people collecting um, will be uh, basically spending their time and their effort to plate out specimens. And then we will sequence those and return back information on, on the species that we've, that we've identified there. So just to close up, the, um, I think it's really exciting times for insect genomics and um, the, I'm really like so keen to try to unite this Bioscan project and these Earth Biogenome project style uh, endeavors like the Darwin Tree of Life to connect up so that we are future-proofing all this work uh, that we need to do to barcode and to understand how species are changing uh, over space and time, especially given climate change, and to make sure that the, all those efforts are future-proof so that we can actually generate high-quality reference genomes from those same specimens later on in the project. Um, so um, what next? Next year, early next year, we're looking for to, to sort of pilot this in a little bit more of a large scale effort than in my garden. And um, we're, we're gonna ask these sorts of questions around, you know, is this reasonable? Does it work? Are we capturing the kind of diversity we expect? What do we do with big specimens that don't fit into a plate? Do we have the right lysis buffer recipe? Um, do people who send their samples in want their specimens back? Um, and how fast can we do this? We wanna be able to do this relatively quickly so that partners are getting information back on, on the biodiversity at their sites relatively quickly. Um, so I'm really open to suggestions and I want this to be as valuable as possible to as many people working out there. Uh, so get in touch if you're interested in, in getting involved. And just to say, that the, this is my last slide, just to say um, in particular, I'd like to be focusing on some of the 
hyper diverse fly families that are present in the UK. <laughs> um, so with that, thank you very much. And I think I start sharing my screen now. Thank you. You know I'm super excited about this project because it's just answering lots of questions that we will have. And apparently everyone else has. So I will start straight away with some questions. Um, you deep diving into groups. This is kind of being as someone else asked this as well. Barbara and John Ismay and uh, yes, in fact, so the acolytrates are very curious about. So propunculids and, and chloropids and things like that, where there's some very closely related species. Will you be deep diving into those? Um, so this is why I need to connect with all of you because I don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> don't admit that, don't admit that. Yes, uh, so uh, yeah, well, they're very, um, they are very diverse groups. And then again, we have so many problems in the UK with a lot of very, very closely related species. So this is. So, I mean, that is a big, that is a big advantage of, of what we're trying to do with these is that I think it will start to really um, give us a genomic perspective on what on how these things that are really difficult to tell apart, do they really look different at their genomic level? And um, is, does a barcode work or does a barcode not work? And can we actually, when we start to get enough of those skeleton reference genomes, can we start to build slightly more sophisticated barcoding methods that would allow us to then not have to sequence whole genomes all the time, but still tell us a lot, lot more resolution on what species is what. Well. Yeah, uh, really good question from Gabrielle Neve. How to distinguish whether a specimen had been what a specimen has been in contact with when alive versus one that it comes into contact with in the trap in the malaise trap. Yeah, that's a really good question, and um, I'm hoping that the answer to that question is going to be <laughs> that we um, that it's the numbers game. So the person who asked that question is correct. I think when a, when, a, when a specimen is in the soup of the malaise trap and there are hundreds of other specimens in there, there's going to be pollen released and it's just gonna be floating around and it's gonna end up on lots of different organisms. But when we see the same repeated interactions across many traps and across space and time, I think we'll have more, much more clear resolution about what is true interaction versus noise. So that's basically a signal to noise question. And I think it's that the answer to that is that we just need a lot of numbers, a lot of specimens to find out what the signal is. Okay. Uh, from Denise uh, Warman, if I've pronounced your name right, sorry. Do species need to be collected into PCR clean tubes for the Darwin Tree of Life project? Um, species need to be collected into barcoded tubes for, so that little orange cap tube. Um, they need to be collected into those for this project. And um, I think that is the, you know, Linda mentioned it and I've mentioned it. I think right now where we are in the project, I think the best approach would be to get in direct touch if you want to collect, but also to think about whether going to Whiteham Woods might be an option if, if the specimens you want to collect are there, because then you can work with, um, with a really good setup where they have access to dry ice and minus 80s. And we know that we will generate high quality material out of the specimens that are collected. I think we still need a bit more time in the project before we're able to send out tubes. Um, yeah. Unless you want to send, if you want to send live specimens to Lindell, great. Um, <laughs> but if you want to kind of collect into a tube that would go straight into sequencing, I think we need a little bit more time there. Okay, and I'm going to ask one final slightly contentious question before we have our coffee break. Um, as these technologies become cheaper and more accessible, are they going to replace traditional taxonomy and morphology? And that's from yeah. Oliver Lonsdale. <laughs> that's one we all ask. I don't think they will replace it, but I think they will have a really big impact on shaping our understanding. Um, I don't see that traditional taxonomy uh, is, is ever going to go away. I mean, we need, we need to understand the biology of the organisms and, and the morphology of the organisms. And, and these need to also be curated and we need to understand, you know, th there's a huge amount of effort that all of the museums will know in intimately that I know much less well. So Erica, you could, you should answer this question. Um, that I think uh, there's so much value in these collections uh, that really the DNA doesn't give you on its own. You need to have, you need to have that combination. Yeah, see, now we can carry on working together. Correctly answered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Zoe, before we go to the break, do you want to say anything? 
Yeah, thanks, Erica, and uh, thanks, Mara. Um, yes, we have a we have a short comfort break now, so um, we can all nip to the loo, get ourselves another cup of tea, um, recover from what was what was a somewhat rushed beginning. Um, so we will reconvene at uh, ten to twelve. So please carry on um, putting in your questions um, and. Things that don't get answered now, we can, we can, this is all going to be recorded, so we can try and answer them later on. And I am going to try and show, show my screen just um, so that, uh, this is just a guide to, oh no, this is the wrong slide. Excuse me, I'll stop that. Uh, aha, here we go, this is the one I want. So this is just, in case anyone's um, stumped by the whole how to ask a question, this is just a quick um, instructions for doing that. So I'm gonna leave this up while we all go off and have a coffee. So with that, I will see you all again at 10 to 12. Okay, bye.
Hi, everyone. Are we ready to start back? Yes. Hi. <laughs> okay. Right. Now, I um, was I going to show a slide? I can't remember. Here we go. There are a few slides for that. No, that's Okay, now this, I was going to show this slide at the beginning, but um, we were a little bit rushed because we had some technical issues. So uh, this is just to remind everyone um, where you can find us. Um, we are on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and I've put YouTube up there because we're, we're recording uh, this morning's session. And we, the DF has just recently set up uh, a YouTube channel what, specifically for the Dictus Forum. So once we've edited the, um, the recording of today's session, we're going to post that onto the YouTube channel. So you will be able to watch back um, and uh, have another look at today's talks. Um, and hopefully the, uh, the webinar software that we're using today is going to capture the, um, the questions that have been asked um, and things that have been posted in the chat. Uh, and it's also going to do some, uh, some analysis on what's gone on today, how many people attended um, and interactions and so on. So we will get some feedback from today's session uh, and hopefully we'll be able to gauge how well this online format has gone and, and so on. Hey, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Can you show the slide of these links for everyone? Is it not? Uh, can you see it now? Yes. Excellent. We can see your presenter view though. Uh, okay. I need to swap them over. Is that better? That's perfect. That better? Thank you very much. Thank Excellent. You. Uh, now this this is not the um, the link for the YouTube channel because I'm not I'm not 100% sure what that is because it, it is very recent. Um, Victoria Burton has only just set it up for us. Um, but we will uh, post the link to the YouTube channel for the recording onto the Dictus Forum website. So, um, so there, there will be more to come uh, output from today. So um, just keep looking at the website for that information. Okay, so our next speaker is in fact me. So I'm going to introduce myself. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know me, um, I took over as Indoor Meeting Secretary uh, last year from Martin Drake. So this is my first um, AGM slash Dipris Day. Uh, it was going to be at the museum, as you all know, um, but obviously that hasn't happened. So we're doing this instead. So hopefully it will be a success and you will enjoy the day. So without further ado, I think I need to find my presentation. Okay, I need to swap it. Have you got the right view now? Is that okay? Yeah? Okay. So, um, Basically, um, you've had um, a nice introduction from Lyndall to um, how we're sampling the Diptera uh, and a very nice uh, talk from Mara talking about um, how the technical side of things works. So uh, this is just um, a summary from me um, of what this is really going to mean for the UK Diptera fauna. So uh, I've got a couple of slides talking about what uh, sequence information is available at the moment. So that's before the Darwin Tree of Life project. And then a couple of slides um, talking about challenges that are really specific to uh, the UK Diptera. And um, both Mara and Lyndall have made reference to that already. So there are some, some issues there. 
Um, and then the last few slides are really just uh, me having a bit of fun looking in the literature um, at interesting papers or the papers that I thought were interesting. Um, Mara has talked about this as well, um, of the, the uses that we can make um, of these, these genomes that we're generating. So it's, um, you know, the future is bright and it looks, there are lots of exciting things that we can do. Okay, so. So this is not by any means um, a, a summary of all the papers that have been published. Um, this is just um, a web of science search that I did. Um, my keywords were I searched for diptera and whole genome, uh, and it gave me uh, 1,800 results. I mean, I, I think the absolute number isn't really that important. Um, my timeline here, I've, this is deliberate. I've started in 1990 because that was when the Human Genome Project was launched. I'm sure we can all remember that. It was a very exciting bit of science. Um, and the, the first draft of the Human Genome came out in 2000. Uh, and you can see that um, things have taken off since then um, and more and more papers are coming out. I don't think this is a, there's going to be any sort of one-to-one -one relationship between the number of genomes that are published and the number of papers that are published, because obviously what, is a, what makes for a minimum publishable unit um, will change over time. At the start, gene, you know, producing a genome was a very sexy piece of science, but each genome would have got its own paper. But these days, um, just producing a genome is no longer notable, so you're not going to get a one-to-one -one relationship between um, producing a genome and publishing a paper. Uh, so this is really just to show, I suppose this is more to point out that how new this field is um, and how it's expanding. Um, and you know, there's a, a really high rate of change in this field, so things are changing all the time. So this... Uh, Okay, so I think the eagle-eyed among you are going to be disrespecting my graphic uh, already. Um, there are a few problems with this. This was generated automatically for me by uh, the Web of Science, so I'm going to disown this graphic. Uh, uh, last time I checked, the UK was still busy leaving the EU. As far as I know, England has yet to leave the UK, so this separation here is an obvious uh, mistake. And we've got the same thing going on with China here, separated into two pieces. So um, the, the statistics were uh, the USA is producing about 50% of these papers. Uh, and then the, U the UK is in at 19%. Uh, and then it's China at about 13%, followed by places like France and Germany. So the UK is doing a good job. We're, we're producing a lot of research here. So this is um, a little graphic on, this is actual um, genomes that have been published. Now there's a whole bunch of acronyms up, up here. Um, don't worry too much about these. These Basically, these are the really big databases that are holding, hosting sequence data. Um, and the big one is the International Nucleotide Sequence Database uh, Collaboration. Uh, and that is actually a, a group of three uh, different databases. We've got the ENA, which is the European offer, uh, NCBI, which is the American one, and then the DDBJ, which is a Japanese database. And these three databases, they all talk to each other on a very regular basis. So in practice, it shouldn't make a difference which one of these you search on. They should all be returning the same sequence information. So my sequence, uh, my search was on the NCBI genome database. Um, they have a number of databases. Um, you know, the most famous one, of course, is GenBank. That's part of NCBI. But this one is Genome, um, and this is for published genomes. Uh, I searched for Diptera. Uh, I wasn't able to re restrict my search to the UK. So this is just all published Diptera genomes. Uh, my results, I had 282 whole genomes. 329 organelle genomes. So that's going to be something like the genome for the um, uh, mitochondria, that sort of thing. So it's a mitochondrial genome. It's not the whole um, genome for the organism. And these are coming from 170 different taxa. 
Um, and it's possibly worth pointing out that these are scaffolds. Um, and what do we mean when we say something's a scaffold? Well, we don't know precisely every single uh, base pair in the genome. There are gaps, but it has been put together and we've got long reads where we know all of the base pairs and then there'll be a gap and then we get another long read. So this is, this is called a scaffold. So it's not absolutely everything that's in the genome, but it's a lot of very useful information. So this table is just a summary of, you know, what are, where are these genomes coming from? Uh, and this is no surprise, we've got Drosophila at the top at 76. And this has been a, a genetic model um, organism for many, many years. So it's really no surprise that we've got lots of genomes for Drosophila. And then we've got uh, quite a high number for Culysis, obviously mosquitoes, and then on down through these other families. Um, so, you know, what's out there already doesn't really come as a surprise. Um, oh, I'm getting some noise interference, so um, can people check whether they've got their microphones muted? Because uh, we can hear someone's background at the moment. Okay, excellent. So, this is a search for DNA barcodes. So this is a, a different database. This is the BOLD database. And this reference here um, is really uh, the BOLD people setting out their stage for their grand scheme. They're going to, you know, they're going to asking us to generate uh, DNA barcode sequencing for, for life, for everything. Uh, so this came out in 2007. And the, really the major difference with the BOLD database is that they're trying to get everyone to sequence the same gene so that the sequences from all these different organisms are directly comparable. So the, the, the gene they chose was the cytochrome C oxidase subunit number one. So the vast majority of the information that's in the BOLD database is going to be for this single CO1 gene. Uh, now, Mara has already touched on the, the problems that are you know, inherent in trying to use a single gene for everything. Um, and you know, no surprise, this has turned out to not be possible. So uh, things like vascular plants, they have to use a different gene. Um, and fungi, they can't use the CO1 gene for those either. So there are more, uh, it is more than CO1 in the bulk database, but a lot of it, um, the metazoan is all CO1. So this was a search. They have much better metadata on bold. So I was able to restrict this to the UK. So all of the, all of this stuff, um, that I've got out has come from specimens that were sampled in the UK. So I've got 2,300 published records. Um, and it says that they're coming from 282 different species. So um, what are these species? Well, these, these are not the same uh, groups as the genome, the published genomes. We have got um, high numbers for mosquitoes, um, but then we've got simulates. Um, uh, and they weren't in the other list at all, I don't think. Um, so uh, the eagle-eyed among you will see that um, apparently Bold has found um, some extra taxa in the UK for us, which is, you know, what oh, top result. Um, this is obviously not true. Um, people have put things into Bold, um, you know, as a... Um, for example, in the simulates, it says we've only got one species to go and we're at 97%. Um, there's actually stuff in there. Um, there are species complexes in there where you have to look at the chromosomes to uh, distinguish the, the very close sibling species. And so there are things in there that are um, a particular species, uh, sensu latu or sensu stricto or near this species. And all of those will be returned as different taxa. So the numbers are inflated here, and we haven't actually um, got complete coverage or near complete coverage for, uh, for these things yet. Uh, and it's, it certainly hasn't found uh, cryptic species that we didn't know we had in the UK. Okay. Right. So um, I think I'm rapidly running out. Yes. OK, so this was a very useful publication uh, that has only just come out. This is October um, 2020, uh, and this is from some colleagues um, at the museum. Um, and they 
they're using the UK species index list. Um, so they're saying that there are 76,000 species in the UK. Um, and uh, interesting things like um, possibly as much as 5% of the, the UK biota is um, could be classed as endangered. Um, so it's going to be difficult for us to um, sample these things. So that brings me on to my next slide. So what are the challenges that are specific to uh, the UK Diptera? Um, so this uh, is, Mara mentioned this and Lindell also mentioned this, um, that we need, um, your insect needs to be a decent size if we're going to get a genome out of it. So uh, in this red box here, I've got a little uh, figure. This is taken from uh, the um, introduction to families of British diptera that Stuart Ball put together for the Dipteris Forum. My copy of it is from 2008. Um, and there he's classified the families according to how large they are. Now, uh, this is worst case scenario, okay? So this, this is, these numbers are inflated um, because I've just entered uh, the smallest uh, representatives from a particular family. Um, so this is the bottom end uh, of these families. So they go all the way down to less than two millimeters. Uh, so we've got 17 families that have representatives at less than two millimeters. Um, and this is over 3,860 species. Um, so it could be as much as half of the UK diptera that we won't be able to sample because they're, they're just too small. Um, now up here, this is my timeline, I've got a timeline in here, um, because I feel that this issue of size is actually the least of our problems, and that by the end of the Darwin Tree of Life project, um, this stuff will be solved, because the technology is moving so fast, and Lindell and um, Mara have said this themselves, it's just changing so rapidly that we can do more and more with less and less. So, I don't, I don't see this as a big issue, um, a big barrier to the project. I think we will, this will be overcome. Um, you know, 1990, start of the human genome, um, finished in 2000, so that's a decade to do one genome. Um, and the, the estimated cost was 3.8 billion pounds. Um, so provided my maths is correct, that's 613,000 pounds per megabase. Uh, jump forward to 2018, and this is the, Sa the Sanger Institute uh, doing the UK Biobank Vanguard project. Uh, and this was a pilot project, uh, and they sequenced 50,000 human genomes at a cost of 30 million. So this is nine pence per megabase. So in two decades, we've seen this vast reduction in the cost of doing the genome. Uh, and the 2019 follow-on project from the Vanguard is to bump this number up to half a million human genomes. And the funding for this is 200 million pounds. And so we've, we've changed again. This, we're now down to seven pence per megabase. And this is just a little graphic from the Sanger Institute. Um, and this is, this is the rate that they're getting through uh, information. And you can see that this is increasing exponentially. So 2016, they were churning through 1.9 petabases. Uh, what's a petabase? Well, that's 10 to the power of 15. So we've got 15 zeros here, and it's shot up in the space of four years from 1.9 to 17.8. So the, this, this technology is just moving so fast. I don't see this being a big problem. Uh, okay, so what does the UK fauna look like? This is just a graphic of all the families. We've got 109 families, 6,669 species. Um, so we're approximately 9% of the British biota. So that's a, a, a neat number. Um, and as Mara pointed out, we have got these mega diverse uh, families here at this top end. And these are all small nematocera that are difficult to identify. So this, this end of it is going to be an issue. Uh, so how easy are they to identify? So that's back to this problem here. So at the top, we've got fiendishly difficult, uh, going down to easy here. And uh, again, this is worst case scenario. So this is the top end number for each of these families. Obviously, some individual um, species in this family will be easy, but some of them 
are fiendishly difficult. And we've got three families in here. This is including um, the Cessidomyids, which is the most diverse family in the UK. So uh, according to this, um, there's a higher proportion of the UK um, fauna that we're not going to be able to identify. So, um, so this is probably going to be our big problem. Um, and I think that, uh, as Mara pointed out, um, I think that the DNA is going to come to our rescue here. Because if we can sort out um, effective barcodes um, that can identify these things uh, using small amounts of tissue, then there is a possibility that we can get um, a barcode for an unidentified fly, um, run that barcode in real time, establish that it's a fly that we want, um, and then the rest of the fly, or you know, we've just we've used some sort of lysis buffer to get the um, DNA for the barcode out of the fly without destroying it. Um, and that fly can then go forward um, potentially for a genome uh, in the future. So there are way, there are ways around this um, identification impediment. And with that, I think my time is up and I had better stop talking. No. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, Zoe. Um, so we've got some questions coming in. Um, I'd quite, quite like to start off by saying, presumably um, when we have all this data, there's going to be quite a lot of revision to the checklist. There'll be species splits that we don't know about. Is there any kind of system to think about how that might be put into process? I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask that question, but um, given the amount of data that um, these DNA people are getting through, they are, you know, they are whizzes at sorting out, um, you know, databases, managing your information. So I think they'll be able to support us with um, running our UK checklist in a more sort of um, effective way. Um, we just need to ask the right people um, and the right questions, you know, how are we going to manage this, um, this information? Um, so that it's it's up to date um, and usable. Um, so Nigel actually asked a question earlier, which was related, I think, to what you were were hinting, is that um, there are a lot of species that can only be identified using quite difficult characters under the microscope. So can you foresee a situation where people can actually just maybe remove a leg and have that barcoded and? and that could help in the identification process. Do you think that's something we could see very quickly? I don't, I, I don't know how soon it's going to happen, but I'm, I'm put, I'm, this stuff is moving so fast and they are doing so much more with, with less and less DNA. But I think that this, this, is, this is the way it's going to go. Um, and I think we should be optimistic. I, I do think that they will be able to do this stuff. Um, I did go on one of the, the bio blitzes um, when we were able to go out and you know be close to people and so on. I went to Ainsdale um, and they took a little mobile lab with them and they had sequences there and they were sequencing things in real time. Um, so they were actually producing um, you know the sequence data um, on the spot while we were watching them, looking over their shoulder literally. So I think it is entirely feasible that. Um, once they've sorted out um, how to get, you know, long reads. So at the moment, as, as Mara pointed out, um, the problem with getting genomes um, from very small um, flies is that there isn't, there's not enough tissue um, and they, they need the DNA to be um, very long pieces of DNA. So we have to do this flash freezing and so on. But they, you know, the, the team at Sanger are there, they're working on this and they're trying, they're going to try and sort this out for us so that we won't need such long reads of DNA to get a genome and also that we won't need so much tissue um, to be able to get a deno genome. And also there's the, the Bioscan project that Mara mentioned that um, is going to try and come up with better, because there is a problem with barcodes and this, this uh, fixation on CO1. It just doesn't work. Um, in some instances, and Mara gave the example of mosquitoes. So hopefully this Bioscan project is going to come up with a, a better suite um, of more genes 
that is going to really enable us to to identify everything um, effectively. Um, and once we've set that up, then yes, we can you know we can use some sort of lysis buffer to wash a bit of DNA out of the whole fly. Um, that DNA can go quickly onto the little on-scene sequencer. Um, it tells us what the barcode is, and then we know whether we we are interested in that fly or not, whether we've already got the information or whether we need the information. Um, and maybe we've got multiple individuals, yeah, uh, of the same um, species, and they're all lined up. And so, you know, different individuals. If we've barcoded them all with our lysis buffer. Um, we can choose the one to go for a genome, uh, one to go to the expert taxonomist to be identified, and so on. So it, it, I think it will be possible, and I, you know, we can do this. This will happen. <laughs> it's how I feel about it. <laughs> okay, so I think on that very optimistic note, we'll leave that talk. Thank you very much, Zoe, for putting all the earlier talks into context. And we'll now move on to the next talks. So the next uh, couple of talks are on some of our more recent recording schemes and the DITRIS forum. And the first of this is the sarcophagid recording scheme. And I think we have two speakers here, Charlie Griffiths and Dan Whitman. I can see Charlie there. We have, is Dan talking as well or not? Uh, so, yes. oh, there with more, yeah. It packs all the uh, technological stuff to too much to get two speakers talking here. Um, but we look forward to this talk <laughs> on the project. So I'll let Zoe hand those speakers over now. Okay, I think. There we go. Oh, uh, can everyone see my screen? You're on presenter view though. Okay, I'll just swap it around. Uh, sorry, just a minute. Oh, now it chooses not to work. Sorry about this, just having a few technical difficulties. Oh dear, okay. Sorry about this. Charlie, you may want to actually um, turn your camera off of you, your webcam, and just have that if you've got okay. an internet. Obviously, I'm not implying that we don't want to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can everyone see that? Perfect. All right, excellent. I'll go ahead then. Okay, I'll, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name's Charlie Griffiths. I'm a co-organizer of the Sarcophagidae Recording Scheme, which I'll refer to as the SRS for sort of time reasons. And I work alongside Daniel Whitmore, who's the uh, scheme lead, and uh, Nigel Jones, who's also a co-organizer for the scheme. So just briefly, my, myself and Dan will be giving a summary of the activities that the SRS has undertaken since beginning in February of this year. And um, basically I'll be handling the first half and just giving a basic overview of the family and our activities. And Daniel will give a more detailed uh, overview in the second half. So really the sort of point of the uh, uh, Sarcophage Day recording scheme, the SRS, is to recruit uh, recorders in order to gather sarcophagic uh, records and uh, increase interest in the family, which has historically been maybe underrepresented in recording efforts. Um, so for those who aren't really familiar with the family, I'll just give you a brief overview of, of uh, sarcophagidae. So the common name for uh, sarcophagids is, uh, is flesh flies, which this this common name sort of conjures up this Hollywood-esque image of these sort of flesh-eating creatures. Um, 
but really the reverse is true. They're, they're really uh, a range of important uh, ecosystem provisioning organisms. Indeed, they're uh, known as important decomposers, uh, pollinators, and biological control agents, potentially in agriculture. And um, they also uh, possess a number of unique behaviours. So uh, the um, many species uh, are collective parasites and uh, of solitary wasps and bees, and other species are important predators and uh, parasitoids of organisms such as grasshoppers. The males of the family usually in, uh, exhibit these sort of uh, summiting behaviours. Well, they'll try and or they'll sort of migrate to the highest um, uh, feature in their local environment. And also uh, many are uh, ovoviraporous, meaning that they'll sort of lay live young uh, on uh, decaying uh, material. Um, well, hence their common name. But I really think that, you know, they get a bad rep because of their common name maybe. And they're really poor, important and interesting group of organisms. But what distinguishes um, sarcophages from other families, such as Califoridae? Well, they're well known for their free black and grey longitudinal stripes on their abdomen, uh, so on their thorax, sorry, and the checkered tessellated pattern on their abdomen. Their eyes are quite large and red, and the um, medial vein, one plus two, is always present in the wing veination. So I'll just quickly, uh, just just very briefly discuss their sort of diversity. So the family is broken down into three subfamilies, um, and they're very closely related to to, to Cynids, to Caliphorids, and to, to Rhinophorids. Uh, and there's approximately uh, one thousand uh, three thousand one hundred species worldwide. So this number is rapidly growing. So how many uh, sarcophagids? Uh, sarcophagid species are there in the UK. In in the UK in total, there are about 65 species. Um, breaking that number down, uh, it was 62, but recently a uh, new species, Sarcophagia bul uh, bulgarica, has been added. And there are two uh, other species that Anu is uh, hoping to add to that UK list. Um, that those 65 species represent 20% of the total European uh, sarcophagid species. Uh, and as a little factoid, uh, the UK species, I think, approximately uh, represent 2% of species worldwide, though I think I'll have to check my maths on that. So um, just quickly over uh, trapping and collecting, there are a variety of methods that you can employ to um, uh, collect and trap sock budgets, that those being pan traps, malaise traps, bait traps, and of course, sweet netting. Um, I provided a variety of links with, on the uh, this presentation slide, which should be available after the AGM for people to access, hopefully, and so you can follow these links. However, there are a, a variety of like homemade options online that you can search for, so I'd definitely try it as a sort of cost-effective uh, strategy for uh, um, personally, I use um, pan traps as a sort of uh, like a omnipresent sort of uh, method of uh, catching sarcophages in the environment. I uh, I do use bait traps as well, but you know, uh, one sort of tip about bait traps: they're great for attracting different sarcophages species, but do not open them in your flat or your house or what have you. Um, He's just when you're opening it, open them outside. Uh, I learned that to my own uh, through my own experiences. But also, sweet nettings are just—they're a really great uh, family that you can just go to an environment and sweet net and collect them as well. But you know, all these um, methods are are great to use. But where are uh, sarcophagids? Where 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 do they inhabit? And where, when can you find them? So, as to when. Um, sarcophagids are particularly males and most active in the warmest months of the year um, and also when their hosts are active uh, from um, 
and they're active mostly from April to September, uh, particularly during full on sunny weather. Um, and they may be found in uh, habitats uh, such as sandy dunes on coasts. Um, as a sort of a little anecdote, myself and Nigel went to Innisless in North Wales last year, and we managed to collect about uh, six or seven uh, species just on top of one sand dune, which must which wouldn't have been more than a few square um, meters. So, it, you know, sand dune, sandy dunes are a brilliant place to collect sarcophages. Also, chalk grasslands, forest edges, well lit forest edges, and hilltops. Uh, hilltops, in particular, due to their summiting behaviour, are a great place. Uh, are great places to search for uh, Also, on top of flowers such as umbellifers, are also uh, good sites or good things to look for sarcophages. Oh, some animations there. Just try and get past those. Okay, so just a brief overview of pinning and preservation. Um, you can preserve uh, sarcophages in 70-75% ethanol, um, but be sure with the males to hinge the genitals out before you know uh, permanently storing them. Um, I usually uh, collect them dry, so um, I sweep net up sarcophages. Uh, um, I'll then use ethyl acetate to euthanize them, and then um, uh, pin, uh, pin them. So you should um, pin uh, sarcophages after um, well, a day, pre uh, sort of like pre preferably a day maybe after uh, to avoid rigor mortis. And also uh, during pinning, you should prepare the male genitalia. Uh, if you leave them too long, you may use a, a humidifying chamber, a reflecting, uh, relaxing fluid, or crushed cherry laurel leaves inside of a vessel, you know, uh, just put the specimens in the leaves, ensuring that they don't touch uh, the um, insects, the leaves don't touch the insects, um, to relax the specimens. But um, I would say, this is just a brief overview of all these sort of, uh, of the collection pinning and preservation methods. For a much detailed view, we've got a like a fabulous document on that Daniels compiled and made on the recording scheme page on the Diptris Forum website. I've provided a link to it on this slide, but please go and if you want more information, go and check that out on our um, web page. So just, just briefly about uh, uh, the SRS. Uh, before the SRS, uh, Sarcophage Day records were submitted to uh, various websites like iRecord or MBN by a small and committed number of recorders. However, we've we've in in initiating the recording scheme, we've really managed to generate a lot of interest in the group and uh, build a uh, we're starting to build a community of recorders. So, like the response, especially on the Facebook page, has been really great. There we go. Okay, speaking of which, uh, we've got various uh, social media channels which uh, we employ to uh, to recruit recorders and to generate interest in the group. Um, the Facebook group in particular is great. You can just put uh, a photo of your um, of of an, of an insect of the genitalia or just a picture of the whole organism on, and um, we'll we'll um, get around to helping you with. Uh, uh, any help, advice, or pointers we can give you with identifying the uh, the species, if possible. Uh, it's also a great place to advertise. Uh, place. It's also a great place where we advertise events. So yeah, I'd really uh, recommend checking it out. Um, we've also got a Twitter handle, so that's a Twitter UK Sarks uh, page. Uh, and I said all of our resources. Uh, can be found on the Sarcophage Day Recording Scheme uh, webpage on the Diptrius Forum website. Also, um, Daniel did a Flesh Flies webinar with Northwest Invertebrates yesterday, and that should um, be available on their YouTube channel within the next few days. Uh, I mean, it, really, we have received a great 
um, response from people um, with getting with vis a vis getting interest in the group. And it's it's a really great family to be get involved in. Whether you're sort of an old hand, it's a you know there are 65 species in the UK, and it's not too insurmountable a group to 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 either start with or sort of uh, get get acquainted with, so to speak. But no, it's it so far the response has been really good. Anyway, I think I'll hand over to uh, Daniel Whitmore uh, now for a more detailed. Uh, account of what activities we've been. Hi, yeah, thanks, Charlie. Um, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to have to ask you to uh, change the slides yourself because I can't do that. Okay. Sure. The next slide. I'll do that. So, yep. The next slide is a bit of a repetition of the previous one. So, yeah, we have our social media platforms and uh, the website as part of the Dipris Forum website. And I just wanted to add about the Facebook group. So some of the recording scheme Facebook groups are kind of more for recording proper. So like the Hoverfly group, for example, um, lots of people post their records directly on Facebook and the, the managers of the group uh, enter the records on, on iRecord or into their own databases. So the way we've set up the group is slightly different also because uh, fewer uh, sarcophages can be identified from photos compared to hoverflies, for example. Uh, it's more of a place to discuss and initiate um, yeah, some 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 questions and answers about how to identify where to collect and things like that. Can you next slide, please? Okay. So we, as Charlie mentioned, the the, the scheme was launched uh, last spring, and uh, so far most of the verification of records has taken place within the I records iRecord uh, environment and we've accepted just over 2,500 records which seamlessly uh, go then into NBN. Next slide please Charlie. Okay and NBN has 9,759 uh, fire records from 74 data sets. Next slide. And if we look at this graph of the main contributors to the data on MBN, so um, uh, we're just ahead now of the Welsh Invertebrate Database and with 25% of records. And then after that, um, there are the records um, from iRecord um, from the time before the actual recording scheme was officially launched. And the remaining 32% of records uh, belongs to 71 different data sets. Next slide, please. Um, so that means that so within that total, about 68% of the records can be considered as having been reliably verified by people who know um, how to distinguish the species and 32 uh, need checking on a on a data set by data set basis and that's something we still need to do next slide charlie please we also received about uh, just under 2000 records in excel format from seven different recorders which we are still uh, going through and checking if there's anything that stands out as uh, possibly incorrect and which means verifying and also we're entering the data into a format which can be then uploaded onto iRecord because we want to use iRecord as our central platform for uh, bringing all the records ultimately onto NBN. Next slide. 
And we also received PDFs of recording cards by Steve Falk from the early 1980s until 2015, I believe, which contained thousands of records of various families, including sarcophagids, um, which need to be extracted. And this is something we also still need to get around to doing. Next slide. Going back to our iRecord data um, of the 2,100 odd uh, rec verified records, so accepted records of the genus Sarcophaga, which is the most species rich in the UK with about 40 species, 38% are at the genus level only, which reflects the fact that lots of people um, upload uh, photographs without having taken a voucher. And we verify these routinely because um, sometimes you can also get a species idea in rare, in, in rare cases, but normally it, it needs to stay at the, at the genus level. And there's not really a way, as far as I know, but maybe, um, Someone who's more familiar with iRecord can clarify uh, after the talk. There's not really a way of saying, yeah, this, yes, this is correct. So it's correctly identified the genus, but we don't necessarily want to carry it over to NBN because this creates a number of records which aren't uh, really useful from the point of view of, of, of what we want to achieve with the, with the scheme, which is better knowledge of the distribution of, of species rather than genus. Next slide, please. So um, Charlie mentioned a few uh, new species which have arrived uh, recently. I just wanted to run you through a, a couple of these. So the first one is Macronychia striginervis. Um, this uh, species, um, a, a different species was previously confused under this name in the UK. It's actually a, a similar species, the one on the right here on the, in, the, in, the, in the two columns of images, called Macronychia dolini, which has been uh, known in the UK for many years, but it was known under the name of Striginervis. And it wasn't until the other species, the real Striginervis, recently arrived. Um, in, in southern England that um, we realized that uh, this was actually a misidentification. Um, uh, this, these two species had been mis misidentified in Europe for a long time and so we, we checked the holotype of, um, of the Zetestead species, Striginervis, and we were able to, to clarify this difference. Um, the species was first recorded in Cambridgeshire, and it's since been recorded a couple of times on the on the south coast. It's um, it seems likely, um, considering also um, historical collection records, that this species may have arrived only recently in the UK. Next slide, please. South Sarcophaga bulgarica, which uh, Charles mentioned earlier. This one was actually uh, discovered uh, thanks to the, the recording scheme. And um, this photo here was added uh, to um, iRecord uh, under the species Hemaroa. And uh, good thing I clicked on a photo to make it bigger, I realized it was actually a closely related species, very similar looking species called Bulgarica. This is also a species that's quite common in on the continent. And you can see here that it's been recorded now from a few counties in the, in the south east of England. And all the records are from 2009 onwards. So here also an indication that it's probably or possibly a new arrival uh, in the country. Next slide. Another recently discovered species, uh, this was published by Peter Chandler, I should have added that to the, to the slide. So this was also published this year um, based on two male specimens 
um, from one from Scotland and one from Oxfordshire. Um, this is a species which is extremely similar to a very common uh, UK species, which is Metopia argyrocephala. Um, it can only be distinguished by small details of uh, the male genitalia and a few details of the head morphology and ketotaxi. However, the, there seems to be overlap in those characters. So it's really a species that needs to be identified from males which have been yeah. properly <laughs> dissected. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rudely interrupting you. I'm afraid we're running over horribly now. Um, and I, have, I offended myself, so um, I'm saying this with a certain amount of shame because I overran as well. Um, are, we, are you near the end? Yeah, there's one slide left. Okay. So I just I wanted to add that for this species, um, it's um, it's more likely to have just been overlooked rather than a new arrival. Next slide, next species is Sarcophaga crassi palpis, which appeared in London in one of Martin Hall's experiments. It just a female flew in through the window of the NHM and deposited larvae on a dead pig, I believe. And so he got we got a, a series of males and females which were reared from the from the larvae. This is also a Mediterranean, like a, a, a more warm climate species, which maybe arrived during a particularly hot summer. We're not sure if it's established or not, but this one is particularly interesting because it's a species of forensic interest. So with that, I finished. Thanks. Sorry for the... Okay, the thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. And um, we're just going to take a couple, well, one quick question and one comment. So Mark Welsh has asked if you have any, if you plan to run any workshops, ID workshops in the future, obviously assuming that we can get around COVID restrictions eventually. So the plan was to run a couple this autumn already, and obviously they were postponed and... We were talking about that yesterday at the end of the webinar with the um, Tenimtra project and the, the plan would be to possibly go ahead with some workshops next autumn so one year with one year delay but obviously that depends on on the situation it's not really ideal to do online workshops sure <laughs> although maybe uh, possible uh, okay and um with regards to the um, Stephen Falk's records, Elaine Wright has posted a very interesting comment, which might be something you want to go away and think about, is that doing some sort of crowdsourcing to get that data uh, entered into spreadsheets. Um, she thinks lots of people will be very keen to sort of help with that project since there's probably going to be quite a lot of them. And that might be a way to get the data online more quickly. Uh, yeah, something to consider definitely is something I should talk with. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah, we, we need to talk about this and discuss it because the sheets are not necessarily easy to interpret and read. It's all handwritten, scanned, and some of them are quite tough. So, yeah, <laughs> it could work, it could be doable, but. It, need, it needs to be thought out properly beforehand. Okay, I think we'll have to leave it there for the time, but thanks both of you very much. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, our next presentation is from Ryan, and I sincere apologies, Ryan. We've we've overrun horribly, um, so I am sorry about that. Um, oh, no, no worries at all. Now, I think I've given you permission to um, take control, Ryan. Can you see any? Um... Has it come up? I oh, know so much. Can you see anything, Ryan, on your? Um... We've still got the subpatrick recording slides up. If Charles and, and Daniel are still there, um, can you make sure you stopped um, showing your screen? Yeah, that would have to be Charles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. I can't okay. quite see it. Just a second. Okay. 
Are you getting permission yet, Charles? Uh, no, sorry, I'm just trying to... No. Sorry. Okay, Charles, it's coming up now. Oh, per perfect, got it. Okay, excellent. <laughs> sorry for the delay, everyone. Sorry about That's that. Right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Marvellous. Right, ready to begin. Right, this this year I decided to start up the Rhinophorid recording scheme. One reason for this is on Facebook I put on a few um, Rhinophorid records and um, asked if there was a recording scheme. And as you can see, Matt Smith said, if you ask this three times in a row, you end up being the um, national recorder. So I've asked three times. <laughs> And here I am. <laughs> right. Another reason for getting into Rhino Forest, particularly this year, was that I had the lovely opportunity to visit Hartstock Nature Reserve in South Oxfordshire, a stunning part of a stunning bit of um, chalk downland. In, um, I, I, sorry. <laughs> the um, finding Rhino Forest there was very productive. 55 individuals with five species present. Rhinophorida leopard are um, the most common species. This is probably a conservative number as I only um, recorded specimens which were in my pooter. Right, an introduction. So Rhinophoridae are also known as woodland flies, 177 species worldwide. They were originally coined as woodland flies in Cross Key in 1977. This was because their um, ecology outside of rhinophorid paras um, being rhinophorid parasitoids was unknown. They're also known to um, the parasitoids of coleoptera and arachnids globally. They were originally classified as a subfamily in a sub of the subfamily of Tachinidae and later erected as their own um, family in their own right. Eight species present in the UK and four species in Ireland. I'll cover both the recording scheme aims to cover both mainland Britain and the island. You can see here that the um, rhinophorids are in Oust Day, and closely related to sarcophagids, tachinids and calophorids. Here is a table of the species present in mainland Britain and the species present in Ireland. Right, as you can tell that Wood lice are the main hosts of rhinophorids, particularly in, it, in the UK and Ireland. They have an interesting way of parasit being parasitoids. Unlike canopids and tachinids, they don't lay their, lay their eggs directly on the host. They lay their eggs on the substrate, which is contaminated by secretions from the uropod gland of the wood lice, wood lice host. Ocelio saber seems to produce the most of this secretion, and you can see it's utilised here by most of the species in Britain and Ireland as a host. Um, the, the, the eggs are laid on the substrate and then the larvae will hatch and will um, wriggle around for the host. They have a particular preference for wood lice that um, have recently molted and um, they, they work their way up the legs and slowly feed inter internally inside the wood lice, feeding on the haemolith and vital organs, eventually killing the host, pupating and hatching out as adults. How to identify a rhinophorid? They do have a particular jizz in the field and look quite similar to tachinids and caliphorids. I'll go through one of the, some of the features to, um, to describe them. Petioles are a very useful feature within, the, um, within identifying rhinophorids. This is where the medium vein reaches the radial four plus five vein before the wing margin. There are a few examples of the um, petioles in the UK species. Seven species have this feature in the UK, and always to the, to the rules, there's always one exception, Trichogena rupicosa. 
warning, some tachinids also have um, petioles too. I have listed um, cathero catherosia pygmaea, aerotrix, and other species down this side, which are more likely to be confused as rhinophorids. Species on the right-hand column are less likely to. Here's um, Gymnosoma nitens, which is brightly coloured and it's not overly bristly and doesn't look very much like a rhinophorid. So the confusion with this side is less likely. Subscutellans. Tachinids and rhinophorids both have subscutellans. However, in rhinophorids, the subscutellum is much more reduced with a membrane clearly visible, as you can see here. And um, in the tachinids, the, the subscutellum is much larger and that you cannot see the membrane attached. So we have um, Paculia maculata on the left and Aerorista rustica on the, on the right. Possible confusion species are other clitrates, such as sarcophagids, particularly worn specimens could be mistaken as rhinophora lepida. Lydina anea has a very superficial rhinophoridae look, but it doesn't have a petiole on the wing. Catharosia pygmaea also looks like Melanophora rurialis, which I'll cover soon. Um, a few other examples. Yeah. Our uh, Aegisops picolia is quite a, a rare caliphorid. However, this really has the superficial look of rhinophorids too, but it's pretty scarce fly, so not often found in the field. Um, but one of the first species I'll go through is Melanophora rurialis, a distinctive species of rhinophorid in the field, very charcoal black in appearance, widespread throughout Great Britain and Ireland, found on far in North Scotland and wet cork all across the country, possibly declining species, flight season May to October. Um, this species has a strong association with urban environments such as houses and gardens. 10 records in the database which I have are from recorded from house walls, particularly white walls. They've also been recorded in the natural environment on coastal cliffs. As you can see here on Facebook, many of the records that come up are on white walls around houses. So one way of finding this species, you could paint your house white, which could be a good method of discovering this species in your garden. It will be quite hard to see against some of the bricks, I would imagine. So that could mean the species is being under recorded. Here's an, um, a comparison between Melanophora rorealis. It has a much larger gena in comparison to um, Catharosia pygmaea. Yeah, it also Catharosia has orange femora and completely black legs within Melanophora rorealis. And the discal cell is much more elongated in Catharosia pygmaea, much shorter in Melanophora rorealis. Aculia maculata is a distinctive species, widespread. Um, wing waving behavior has been witnessed in, in the field. I witnessed this for the first time in Bursley Wood this year. It's fantastic seeing the um, individual run up and down the tree, waving its wings. Unfortunately, I couldn't get any footage of it, which was a bit of a pain. My camera wouldn't focus on my phone. This was noted as the most common parasitoid of Porcelia scava in bedding. It has yellow wing bases and a strong petiole, and also been picked up in moth traps. Rarely found on flowers, unlike other rhinophorid species. The most common species of rhinophorid, which you're more likely to encounter in the field, is Rhinophora lepida. Um, yarrow is particularly good for this species, I've noticed. It's found in a wide variety of grassland habitats on brownfield sites, chalk grassland, coastal sites. It could be confused with Phania fenesta and Melanomyanana. However, 
10 times hand lens, you can quickly identify this species in the field with its pet, um, petiole on the wing, the nation, and protrude, protruding mouth, as you can see here. Possibly confused with some worn, smaller sarcophagid species. Phyto discrepens. This seems to be a very local species, though I don't have a vast amount of data in the database currently. So that could change over the next couple of years as I gather more data. There's reports of it being common where it's present. It has three small indistinct stripes on the middle of the thorax. It has a small petiole, which you can just about see here at the end of the wing. In contrast to the more common species, Vito melanocephala, that have three broad black stripes, which I'll show you in the next slide. It's found in a variety of habitats, such as gardens, coastal grassland, heathland, and brownfield sites. The other species, which is a bit more common and widespread, is Phyto melanocephala, where it has these three distinctive black stripes down the thorax, as you can see it here in the slide. Widespread across England, with records expanded to Lincolnshire and East Yorkshire, found in a wide range of habitats, particularly dry areas such as brownfield sites, short grass and coastal shingle habitats, and possibly could be confused as sarcophagids in the field. However, sarcophagids do not have the petiole and have much eye redder eyes alive. Stevanium atramentaria, this is a very neat looking fly. This is the, my first um, rhinophorid I ever found. This is at Gatwick Airport, um, brownfield site. Fantastic looking thing with a very strong petiole. Recorded in damp grassland, chalk grassland and clearings. There's one uh, moth trap record so far on my database. All the palpi, antennae and body and legs are entirely black. They're, um, the wings are generally clear. However, there can be some shading along the wing margin and could be confused with Hyaculia maculata. However, if you have a specimen of this, or the other species, they can easily be separated under um, magnification under a microscope. The parafacial hairs and bristles. So Hyaculia maculata, they are completely absent, as you can see on the left here. And they're very strong bristles on the right with a few hairs. So this is a very good feature to use, particularly if you've got pinned material. Stevenia deceptoria, the most recent arrival, first recorded in the UK in 2000. Currently, all the records are situated in Kent and East Sussex. It has a particular fondness for coastal sites. However, it seems to be expanding its range. I had a single Ipswich record in 2018 on iRecord, um, feeding, a female's feeding on ivy. Wings can also be very shaded in this species. As you can see at this top right photo, I was quite surprised how dark the shading was, and that could possibly confuse people for Paculia maculata. However, this is very dusted, especially on the thorax and abdomen. So that should be able to um, rule out any confusion. Um, the last species is Trichogena rubicosa. If you can see here, the species without a petiole. This one confused me when I first found it in the field, thinking it was a tachinid. However, it does have a saving grace that it has this very obvious lobed fifth sternite adaptation, which is very unique. The um, this species has found widespread with one Irish record so far. Goodness, sorry. One Irish record so far and widespread across the country. Uh, recorded from a wide range of habitats, brownfield sites, woodland, chalk grassland. How to look for rhinophorids. Rhinophorids generally aren't that abundant in the environment, ex excluding rhinophorida lepida, which can be abundant in many grassland habitats in the summer. 
best time to look for the adults is May to October. All the records I have currently are within this time period for the adults. You can look on various plants, such as yarrow, hogweed, wild parsnip, daisies, and other um, plants in the field. One of my methods is extensive sweeping of grassland with an entomological aerial net. I'll show you an example of that in the next slide. Other trapping methods which have been used are malaise trapping and pan traps for general ditra. And as a result of that, you get bycatch rhinophorids. Moth trap bycatch as well has been reported with five individuals currently on the recording scheme. Four Pacquiao maculata records and one Stevania atramentaria. Looking around walls and houses, particularly if white, it's worth um, especially worth looking if um, woodlice are particularly abundant around the property. Peculia maculata and Melanophora rorealis both have um, association with urban environments. If you would like to, you can also breed woodlice. However, they have quite a low success rate of parasitization, less than 2% in most cases suggested by the bedding PhD study in 1965. Here's me sweeping at Hartstock Nature Reserve. This is my preferred method of looking for rhinophorids on grassland sites. I'm surprised my bicep isn't huge from the amount of sweeping I did this summer. I, was a, I swept pretty much every square foot of that site, I think. As you can see, my head was. Um, over the net, my head was in the net looking for any rhinophorids that were in the bag and then using a pooter to suck out any um, individuals. What habitats to look for rhinophorids in? Floodplain meadows, brownfield sites, coastal sites, very good, short grassland, heathland, woodland, and also urban environments, which I've already mentioned. So what the scheme will aim to do? First of all, create a comprehensive national database. So I'll be using things like iRecord to gather species records, which I'm currently in the process of verifying all the records. I'm also digitizing museum records. I was thankful for Aidan at the National Museum of Ireland for him to um, send me all the Irish records. And I'm currently in the process of digitizing um, 350 records, which are in the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Other things the scheme will aim to promote, um, well, the scheme will aim to promote awareness via social media, so Facebook and Twitter. Updates in the Bulletin uh, Forum Bulletin, so I'll provide a newsletter as records come in and um, state how the scheme's getting on. My, another aim is to produce a provisional atlas in five years time after five years of data gathering. As it's a very small group of eight species, I'm not going to be overwhelmed with records and hopefully this would give me a good focus to provide to produce a good provisional atlas. Assist with understand assist with understanding more about the ecology, behavior and biology and be a part of con um, for a conservation status reviews in the future. Where is the scheme with the records? Here are the records of the species from highest to lowest. As you can see, Rhinophora lepida is 58% of the records so far. However, this is still quite a small subset of that 1,136 records so far. I'd like to see how this total increases over the next five year period. Luckily, as I mentioned, it's a small group, so verification isn't an overwhelming task. 362 records um, on entered into um, my record so far. How to enter records? I prefer, prefer preferably to have them entered into iRecord with a photograph if possible. I'm also very happy to accept data via email. My own email address is rightmitchell1994 at live.com. 
via spreadsheets, individual re records or inquiries. I'm also active on Twitter, Facebook, on the, the Society of the Study of British Flies, on the DITRA Forum and the UK DITRA page. There are a wide variety of resources. If you don't, if you're not aware of it already, Stephen Falk's Flickr site is absolutely fantastic and a complete must see for a um, British fauna, particularly Ditra and Hymenoptera too. Stephen Falk has also a test key, which is available on the Rhinopod Recording Scheme page on the Ditra's forum website. Um, Olga Seville is currently working on a new Rhinopod key too and on um, subscutellums and deciphering whether you have a tachinid or rhinophorid, it's worth visiting this link here on the tachinid recording scheme page. Another good reason to get outside, especially in the, especially this year, COVID-19 hasn't been the most enjoyable year for anyone. So get out to your local nature reserves, get outside, look for flies and all the better now you can go looking specifically for rhinophorids. Some acknowledgements, I'm very thankful for the Ditris Forum for allowing me to do this talk today. Chris and Martin have been great help and guidance of setting up the scheme and Lawrence Clements have sent me many papers and given me the Kent database which is a good proportion of the database I have so far, about half of it. I'm very thankful to Nigel Jones and others for their assistance. As my references. Any questions? Thanks very much, Ryan. That was really sorry. Good. I, sorry, I was a bit nervous for that and a bit <laughs> a bit jittery. I, I, I for one did not notice, Ryan. Uh, now we have overrun slightly, and I'm I am feeling slightly oh, sorry. sorry, Andy. At the end, don't worry. I overran as well, so the shame is on me. I started it. It's all my fault. Um, Apologies for that. No, no. <laughs> uh, we have got a couple of questions, so I am I am going to pose them quickly to you. Uh, so the first, the first one is from Stephanie Skip, and she is asking: Is there an easy way to tell if a woodlouse is being parasitized by a rhinophorid? Do they change their behaviour or look different? I would imagine so. It's something I really need to look more into. I could give a, an answer by email or something on a later period of time, but I'd imagine, like many other hosts, their behaviour does change while being parasitised, particularly in the last stages, when the larval stage is um, developed closer to um, becoming an adult before the pupation stage. Okay, I know the this, the scheme is new, um, so. Uh, this isn't a criticism, but have you have you had a chance to do uh, any rearing? Not yet. I I was thinking about it, but I think um, having boxes and boxes of wood lice would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something I'm I could possibly look into, especially with uh, Stevenia septoria. We're not sure what the host is yet, so that information would be very exciting to know what it's feeding on. Well, again, maybe that's something that the DNA is going to help us with. Who knows? Uh, now, we have another question. Uh, this one is from Jan, and it's uh, in the Netherlands, graveyards are supposed to be a great collecting site. Do we have similar experience in the UK? Actually, I'm, I'm now wondering, now that I've read that out, if that is a sarcophagid question. Um, so, I there think there have been reports of rhinophorids in graveyards actually from some reading somewhere but I need to follow that up and have a look into that but it could be found quite easily on pale coloured um, gravestones especially rhinophorialis okay so that that's what we're thinking about here them resting on the on the pieces of stone gravestones quite possibly yes yeah okay so that's an interesting thought uh, and we have one more question do we know the prevalence of rhinophorids in small populations of isopods? Um, it was mentioned in the bedding study that they, up to a maximum of 2% um, parasitization rate mm. within populations. 
but I think that okay. yeah so that okay that sounds quite low to me it is quite low so you'll need a lot of wood lice to, to, to start rearing <laughs> out the adults <laughs> yes um yeah okay that's interesting okay right now I think we should probably move on to our last presenter because we are significantly over time now but thank you very much Ryan um and no hopefully there will, there will be a chance to give some more feedback on the questions at the end ah, I Thanks, can see Andy now. hi Andy apologies for the overrun I'm so sorry I hope we're not um wrecking your Saturday to too great an extent no worries it's been really interesting actually thank you for asking me oh, pleasure right now let me sort out the sharing I think you need to stop sharing your screen, Ryan. Okay. And I will try and give permission to Andy. Has that worked, Andy? Something's popped up. Right, okay. let's show that. Great. Can you see that? We can. Yes. Yeah. Great. Everything else has oddly disappeared. Oh, well. Ah, there we Andy. go. That's better. <laughs> Okay. Can you still see my screen? Yes, I think you just need to start your slideshow, Andy. Okay. Great. Okay. Oddly, I can't see Zoe anymore, which is a bit strange, but there we are. Okay, so the original plan for today was to do a workshop after the talk, um, which was going to be uh, fun and hands on. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that. So I'm going to have to tell you about the workshop, which uh, might sound a bit strange, um, but actually it's going to be really helpful for me um, to explain things to you. And then you can give me some feedback at the end. So um, I work in the molecular lab at the Natural History Museum and oh, odd things are happening to my screen. Hang on, let me just shrink that. Excuse me a second. Okay, so uh, here at the Natural History Museum, uh, mm -hmm. we have a DNA sequencing lab and uh, you can come and see us. If you go into the galleries, uh, you can actually uh, look at us through the window, which is a little bit odd, um, but it's, it's quite fun once you get used to it. And we do uh, DNA sequencing, we provide a sequencing service, we have different methods of sequencing. Uh, we do um, Sanger and Illumina and uh, Minion sequencing, uh, but they all basically do the same thing. They're just different methods of uh, looking at DNA. Uh, we love our outreach. Uh, here we are doing some um, uh, Nature Live presentations. So this is something we do in the galleries when we tell people about uh, the sequencing facility. Here we are talking about environmental DNA uh, to the public. Uh, we also do schools workshops. Uh, this is a pop-up Meet the Scientists that we did in the galleries uh, back in January. Uh, and this is European Researchers Night. This is always really good fun. We do uh, DNA extraction from fruit. So uh, we get members of the public to come in and uh, extract uh, DNA themselves and they can physically see the DNA once it's out of the fruit and um, they can take it home with them. So this is really good fun. Children really enjoy this. It's something they can do. Um, and because they can see it, um, it, it it's much easier to explain what's happening because you can talk to them whilst they're doing it and they can they can see and they can feel um, the actual process of DNA extraction. Um, unfortunately, when you're trying to talk about DNA sequencing, there's not really a huge amount that you can do and see for sequencing. So we tend to lose kids. Um, here we are talking to some adults. Um, adults are always really interested and we get lots of, um, lots of questions and it's really good fun. Um, but, you know, children, it's a lot harder. Uh, we uh, came up with this game. My colleagues, Darren and Sarah, um, made this great cardboard DNA sequencer and made a little game to, to, to guess the DNA sequence. Um, and it was fun, um, but we're always looking on ways that we can improve our public engagement. And that's when I discovered the Bricopore from Bloxford. Uh, so it was designed by some people at the Earlham Institute um, for basically this purpose that we wanted. Um, and it's a model of a DNA sequencer that's built entirely out of Lego and it's robotic and it sequences um, Lego DNA. So you, you build DNA out of Lego bricks and then you run it on this sequencer. And it's just a really good way of explaining how actual DNA sequencing works. Um, obviously you can't buy it as a kit because it's only just been invented. You have to buy this uh, Lego Mindstorms kit, which is a couple of hundred pounds because it's got uh, robotic, uh, robotic sensors and all kinds of other things in it. And then you have to buy extra little bricks 
um, and then you put it together. Um, all the instructions are on the Bloxford website, tells you how to make it, and then there's software that you can download uh, and you can put on your laptop. It just runs off a standard, uh, standard PC or Mac. So Earlham have used it quite a few times. Um, here's some images from their website of different, uh, different public engagement activities they've done. You can see it was a great success. Um, and I've stolen quite a lot of their ideas uh, to make our public engagement activity. Um, so I'd made this activity and we were going to run it at the Exhibition Road Festival, which is this photo here, but obviously it was cancelled this year. So um, that means that we haven't had a chance to try it out. Uh, I took it home and tried it on my kids and tweaked it a little bit. Um, but actually, I'm going to run through it with you now uh, to see what you think. And if you've got any comments or questions, that would be really helpful in, um, in how we move this thing forward and, and actually do our first workshop, hopefully in the new year. So how are we going to explain environmental DNA to children in the galleries using Lego? So our first step is to explain that DNA is a bit like uh, an instruction manual. It tells you how to assemble a living thing. Um, now, every living thing has DNA from uh, amoebas to amphibians, from polar bears to potatoes, uh, from boys to beetles. Um, Okay, and every time a living thing molts or emerges or spawns, uh, scratches, drools, sneezes, I like to think that bubble is the new sneezing, uh, does a poo or dies, some of its DNA uh, comes out of it and is released into the environment, which means that in the environment there is DNA. So it's in our soil, it's in the sea, it's in ponds and lakes, rivers and streams, and it's even in the air. Um, and if we can capture this DNA, we can uh, get a good picture of what animals are in our environment. So for soil, you have to extract the DNA from the soil using uh, kits like these. It's a chemical or filter based extraction to wash the soil away from the DNA. Air um, is a little bit easier in a way because we don't have to wash anything out. We just use this uh, this machine here is called a bobcat uh, and it's um, Got lots of fans in it and it basically sucks air through a filter. You have to suck a lot of air through a filter to get a reasonable amount of DNA, um, like a lot, um, but it does work. And uh, his uh, water, I believe these are Lindell's hands actually, uh, collecting some water from a stream and then using syringes to force it through a filter and then you get the DNA off the filter. So uh, since every living thing uh, has DNA and every living thing is unique, the, uh, the DNA of every living thing is unique. So if we can extract it from the environment and read it, we can then identify which animal it came from. So we can get a picture of what animals are living in an environment. Now, when you think about it, Lego, uh, sorry, DNA is a little bit like Lego anyway, uh, in that it's made up of different blocks. So the Lego DNA uh, that we use on the brick pore um, is made up of these four different colours and we use a different colour to represent each of the uh, nucleotides that you would get in a DNA strand. Um, now before you uh, do DNA sequencing, you can't just put DNA straight onto a sequencer, you have to manipulate it in a certain way so that the machine can actually um, get hold of it, can actually read it. So for the brick pore, it's the same thing. You have to make sure that your uh, Lego DNA is exactly 22 bases long and that it has three white bricks on the end as an adapter. So let's hope this works. Uh, yes, so you put your DNA, uh, DNA Lego bricks onto the, new, onto the uh, machine, you press sequence and it pulls the DNA through the machine. Uh, in the same way that, say, a nanopore sequencer would pull a strand of DNA through a pore uh, in a membrane, this pulls it through the robot. Um, and then the software on your laptop generates this thing called squiggle data, which uh, is uh, based on a nanopore uh, sequencing. So that's exactly what you'd see if you were using a nanopore sequencer anyway. And then the squiggle data is converted into base calls, which is how you get the DNA sequence, which appears at the bottom in bright colours. Yep, so there's our squiggle data. Once you've got your sequence, you then hit blast at the top, and that will take you to the NCBI website. This is a GenBank database, and it cuts and pastes your sequences into the GenBank database. It does a search, and then it looks for uh, your sequence. So this is the kind of thing that blast gives you 
you can see that that particular uh, DNA fake DNA strand that we've made uh, was a match to Anopheli Stevensy, um, and so uh, so that's the one that we would tell the kids. You know, your DNA is from this particular animal. Um, now, unfortunately for us, uh, the NCBI gives everything in taxonomic names. So for uh, children, that's a little bit strange. So for this step, you then have to cut and paste that word into Google. Um, but I found practicing this with my own children that actually that wasn't a problem because they're quite used to cutting and pasting things into Google anyway. Um, and when you do that, Google often brings up this nice little picture. So for my youngest son who can't read very well, uh, that was really great. He could put this in and go, oh, I've, I've made the DNA of a mosquito or I've made the DNA of a lion and he could, he could see the picture um, and he really enjoyed it actually. So this is just a video of uh, me practicing this activity with my kids. Um, so my kids don't actually like science, which is a real shame and uh, they don't really understand what I do. But taking this home and practicing with them uh, was really good fun. They really enjoyed it. Um, it was Lego, which is something that they're used to, so they weren't afraid of using it. They're used to using Google and laptops. So again, it was something they were used to. Um, they weren't afraid or embarrassed. Um, and because it's something tactile and it's something they can do and something they can actually see, I found it much easier to explain how DNA sequencing works. Um, and they were actually really engaged with it and they carried on doing it for ages. Um, so I'm really, really hopeful that this particular uh, engagement activity is going to be successful and that we're going to be able to use it a lot in the future. Um, but if you've got any suggestions on how I can improve it, if, I, if there's any steps that didn't make any sense, then I'd love to hear from you in the chat window. That would be great. Or you could ask some questions. Um, and also, since everybody loves DNA, uh, not DNA, everybody loves Lego, um, I'm thinking that uh, actually this is going to be great for adults when we do our evening activities. Um, and there's a, that's a photo of, um, <laughs> of, of people in the galleries having fun um, and our actual Lego sequencer with all our little minifigs. So, uh, and that's the end of my talk. If anyone has any comments or questions, that would be great. Hi, Andy. Thanks very much for that. That was brilliant. And I think uh, you should leave that slide up because if you, if you notice all these little Lego minifigure lab technicians, they're actually wearing these little blue nitrile gloves that you would wear if you were really in the lab. So I just thought that was really sweet when I noticed that. They are all modelled on the lab team, actually. We we um we made them specially out of pot so that they looked oh, like see. members of the lab team. So yeah. where are you in this picture, uh, Andy? I'm bottom right. My hair's grown since then. Oh, this this one. I can't see. I'm still oh. showing my screen. So. <laughs> Are you looking a bit boyish in this picture, Andy? Yeah, I've got short brown hair and I'm okay. on the right hand corner. <laughs> I did have very so, short hair when I made it. <laughs> OK, so, yeah, I think it's a real shame that we weren't able to do this as a as a proper workshop, because I think people would have had fun uh, making their, their Lego mo um, molecules and actually doing the sequencing. And I think the process of actually doing it does um, answer some of the questions that people because it is it is quite a complicated process isn't it and mm. um it does in this your broco pore sequencer what is it a sort of facsimile of is it um because we've heard a few uh different names of different kinds of sequences um rolled off um what's yeah. it closest to so i guess it's a cross between a nanopore sequencer and a sanger sequencer so in nanopore sequencing, uh, the DNA is uh, split into two halves and one half is threaded through pores inside a membrane. And as it's pulled through the pores, the membrane detects exactly which base is going through at that time. And then the data that you get with the squiggles, that is a facsimile of, of what you would get from a nanopore. And then the base calls are based on that as well. And since this is called a bricopore, I think that's what um, that's what they were going for, the guys who invented this. Um, but obviously, it, the way it, the way it actually works is with a little color sensor, and it detects the colors of the bricks that pass through. And that's how Sanger sequencing works, and in a way also Illumina sequencing, um, by you use chemical processes to attach uh, colors to your DNA, and then you read the colors. Um, so it, it, 
in that sense, it's similar to Sanger, but the, the, the squiggle data and the movement of the DNA through is, uh, is based more on, uh, on nanocore sequencing. Okay, so these different styles of sequencing your, your um, DNA, are we using different styles of sequencing for different aspects of the Darwin Tree of Life project? Is that something that you have? I believe it's most of it's going on the pack bio, which uh, we do have in the basement. I didn't mention that one because we're not offering that as a service. We just bought it specifically for the Darwin Tree of Life. Um, I think that's probably one more for Lyndall and Mara, but I think that is all going on the pack bio sequel. Um, SQL um, system. So that's something called smart sequencing. Um, you'd have to ask Mara about that one. Okay. Well, we can, yeah, don't worry, we can um, do answer more questions um, after we finish the session. Okay, so there are a few questions coming up in the chat, so I will read them out. We have uh, a question from Linda um, Pryke. Andy, Maybe a challenge as to who can DNA the largest slash fastest slash tiniest cool animal. <laughs> I, think, I think this is for the children, though possibly for the adults as well. Um, I mean, I, I am yes. quite sad that I'm not now in the in the Angela Marmot with you, Andy, playing with um, DNA. Um, yes, I was looking forward to that. That was going to be the highlight of my day. <laughs> my kids did get really excited actually they were doing this for ages just seeing what they could make and I think the highlight was some um, they've got so many animal toys I mean that some of the photographs I showed you were, were their toys that I used as an explanation and um, they managed to make a langer which is a type of primate which is their current obsession so they were so over the moon that they'd made a langer and so <laughs> they got quite exotic then yes okay another a question from Barbara and John uh could you also explain something about the problems with sequencing, e.g. cleaning up the, the sequence? Um, I Now that I've read that out, that's, that's probably quite technical. Is mm. there a summary of the stages that need to happen? Um, would... Yeah, I think that would be something we talk to about adults rather than kids because it's quite complicated. Um, yeah. Cleaning up the sequence, if you're doing Sanger sequencing, uh, you use something called PCR beforehand, which should help clean up your sequence and just give you the one thing. Um, but it is quite prone to contamination. So you do sometimes get these extra peaks from contamination. Um, and that's very difficult to clean out. Um, if you're doing uh, NGS, so Illumina sequencing, pack bio sequencing, that kind of thing, you have to clean that out later in your data processing. Um, so each individual sequence is clean, but you might have 100 sequences which are supposedly the same thing, but they will vary slightly. So you have to use various bioinformatics tools to clean out your data, um, to clean up the sequences. I hope that answers the question. Yes, I think um, it's, it's easy to get confused because there are these different um, sequencing technologies and mm. depending on which one you use, it has different advantages and different disadvantages and different limitations. So um, you can read that someone did some sequencing and uh, you know, there was this particular limitation. And actually that only applies to one particular style of sequencing. So it is quite a complex thing, isn't it? Yes, exactly. I mean, we've, we currently use three different methods uh, in our labs, depending on what question you're asking. And yes, there is this extra one, which the Darwin Tree of Life is using as well. Um, so yeah, there are currently four methods. We're also in the hopefully in the process of buying another method um, and then there are at least two or three others out there there are so many different ways of doing this um, it, it all gives you a sequence in the end but they all have their different advantages advantages and disadvantages mm. and they're also I mean there are also complications in the kinds of samples that people are using as well aren't they because um, some sequencing um, technologies are applicable if you're um, sampling a particular organism, and then other methods will be used if you're sampling this environmental DNA, um, which is obviously going to be a mixed bag right from the beginning. Um, you haven't yes. separated out your different organisms. So, you know, it's, yes. it's, it's a different beginning, and you're asking different questions, and you're going to get different answers. So, it's yes. by so no for, 
for environmental DNA, you would have to use uh, a, a next generation sequencing technique, Sanger wouldn't work. Um, but um, we've used uh, Nanopore, Illumina and the, the PacBio SQL system uh, would all work quite well for this. Uh, there's a, a question here about the differences in scale. Um, I think this is referring to the fact that your Bricopore sequencer can only do uh, quite a short uh, DNA molecule. So yep. have you have you had any thoughts about how you're going to explain to the children the, the you know the huge differences in scale between what you can do with your Lego and how big an yeah. actual DNA will be? Yeah, so I had a chat with this about my son, uh, chat about this with my son. Um, so yeah, you can only do 22 nucleotides on the Bricopore, which is far too short practically for anything. So um, if you saw on the slide where we had the Anopheles one as the top hit, um, at the bottom there was a breakdown of, of the different hits and it was also pulling up fish and bacteria. Um, so <laughs> 22 is just far too short. Um, but you know, that's that that's how the, the, the Bricopore works. You'd have to buy an awful lot more Lego to make it huge. You'd have to make, make it the size of the table to have anything of any meaningful length. Um, but yeah, if you if you were doing, say, Illumina sequencing, you'd have to shear it. As um, Mara explained earlier, you do have to shear the DNA to be the optimum length, depending on your particular platform. Um, so nanopore sequencing can handle very long stuff, but um, uh, Illumina sequencing is um, much shorter, about sort of 75 to 300 um, up to 500 bases um, which is still an awful lot longer than 22 um, but it is quite short uh, and then Sanger sequencing um, anything up to 1500 is the limit um, yes yeah, so it, it really depends but um, yeah I, that is something that we need to think about um, I think my my oldest son got it he's eight and I, exp I explained it to him in those kind of terms and he understood um, I guess it when you're doing a workshop it's very it's very one-to-one -one and you, you can have conversations with people and you can you can see if they're understanding and you can go into further detail so it's much easier when you're face to face with people yeah i suppose it's it's where the um the lego sort of facsimile breaks down because um if you actually built um a piece of lego that was 235 bricks long that i mean that would be enormous wouldn't it <laughs> yeah it would it would snap quite easily wouldn't it yeah and it would it, be quite um, a, well, yeah, you know, DNA can get sheared, so. <laughs> yeah, and it would it would take a long time to get it through the sequencer, actually. It goes quite quickly, but if you think, if you saw the video of it pulling through, if you had something that long, you'd be standing there for ages waiting for it to go through. Yeah, you might lose the children's attention, mightn't you? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> okay, so I think we've, I think we've run out of Brico for uh, specific questions, but thank you very much, uh, Andy. Um, and, and thanks for um, a special thanks to you because you did have to suddenly adapt what it was that you were going to do for us. Um, so thanks a lot for sticking with us and um, that's okay and, uh, and giving it a go. You've been very game. So thank you, Andy. You're welcome. Right. So, right, everybody, I hope you have enjoyed the day um, and that it's been useful. And I, I would, first of all, I would really like to thank all the speakers uh, for the splendid job that they did um, and their efforts to answer the questions that have come up in the, in the chat. Um, and we will, we will, this is all going to be captured and we can carry on answering these questions. Um, and obviously there's going to be the video of today. So um, I hope you have enjoyed the day and that it's been useful um, and that we've had fun. And um, thanks to everyone who took part. Um, and I think if Rob is there, Rob Walton, are you, are you there? I um, am, you... I am here. Hello, Hello. Rob. Would Hello. you like to Hello. say a few words to the audience? I would, yes. I hope everyone can hear me all, all right. My broadband isn't that good. I can um, hear you. I, I, good, good. It's been a marvellous uh, morning and early afternoon. Uh, fantastic. I've really enjoyed it and I'm sure everybody else has too. And I see there's something like 133 people 
on you know on this webinar which is amazing and thank you all so much for joining us today um just very briefly to mention we do normally have our annual general meeting our agm at this time but we're not doing so you'll be pleased to hear at the moment however there are full details in the dipshire's forum bulletin about how we're managing the agm this year and in particular how we're gaining approval for the accounts and how we're dealing with the election of officers so please those of you who are members do have a look at the bulletin and if you wish to make comments please do so before the 1st of january thank you now it really just leaves me actually to thank lots of people today for, for actually doing this i'll come to you zoe at the end um but just to start then with Callum, Callum Cleary. Thank you, Callum, for doing the technical, all the technical support behind this, and indeed to the Natural History Museum who have facilitated so much of this. So thank you. Um, Erica and Jane, you have both been moderators, so paying attention to questions as they're coming in, for which many thanks. And again, Victoria, I hope you're still with us, but you and Jane, have uh, promoted this event so effectively on social media, thank you. And on the same note, um, as Zoe mentioned, we now do have a bespoke YouTube, cha YouTube channel um, with videos on it. And, we, and these videos, you know, the presentations we've seen today will be placed up there, which is fantastic. So please do please to go to that. And thank you very much to Victoria and to Martin Harvey for setting that up for us. There is now a link to it from the Dipteris Forum page. Uh, I think it's the resources page. Um, now, what else going down my list? I think that probably actually does take me to, um, yes, it takes me to, to Zoe, to yourself. I mean, this has been a pretty, tough thing for you i feel i mean we've we've lumped you in this really you've just taken over from martin it's your first year taking over from martin drake as our indoors meeting secretary and you've done a fantastic job thank you really challenging setting up something like this not for the first time and running it so well and i mean, i look forward to i hope look, people will give us feedback on how this has been from them but I fully expect the feedback will be fantastic. It's been very good from my point of view. So thank you, Zoe, very much for all your hard work organizing this and indeed for chairing it today. So thank you. And thank you everybody who's been involved. Now, I don't wish to know if you wish to make any concluding remark, Zoe, or anybody else who's on the line at the moment. I don't, th I don't think I have anything important to say. Um, just to, to say that I've, I've enjoyed doing this. It's been good fun. Um, it's been a very different day to the one I was expecting. Um, I was uh, upstairs this morning checking that the kids had put their school uniform in the laundry. I certainly wasn't expecting to be doing that this morning if we'd actually been meeting physically at the museum. So uh, it's been quite a strange day. I certainly wasn't expecting to do all this in my slippers, um, but here I am in my slippers. So thank you very much for coming uh, and I hope you have enjoyed it. And um, yes, the, the webinar software that we've used is going to give us uh, a lot of analytics on what's happened today, the engagement. Uh, it's going to capture the questions. It's recorded all the presentations. So we should be able to um, put quite a lot of today's content up on the website. So um, do look at the Diptus Forum website and everything should be there. And I think with that, we are done uh, and uh, we'd like to wish you all um, a nice weekend and thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Have a nice weekend. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm not sure how to end this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where the stop button is. <laughs>
Well, I, I can end it all. There is an end webinar for all on mine. Do you want me to end it? Why not? Yes. Why not? As chairman. Okay. All right. Bye, Bye again, everybody. Bye.